the unenviable task of making everyone sure. <laughs> be quiet and pay attention. Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, session five of this year's Indonesia update. The, the topic is um, uh, governing the urban environment in Indonesia. My name is Phil Cummins. I'm from the ANU. I'm actually from the Research School of Earth Sciences. I've been asked to chair the session and to chair it with ruthless efficiency. So I'll, I'll try, not, try not to waste too much time. We, do, we have three speakers this morning. Yogi Secha Pramana from Leiden University and Bryn and uh, also uh, Muhammad Hali Yudhistira, who thankfully is known as Yudis, goes by Yudis, from uh, Universitas Indonesia, and Nur Aziza from the ANU. So, uh, since we really want to stay on time, uh, without further ado, I will, uh, I will introduce the first speaker, uh, and that is Yogi, going to be talking about flood, I believe, flood management in, in Indonesia. Yeah. Over to you. Yes, um, good morning everyone, thank you. I'm very glad to be back at the ANU. Um, thank you to Pa'et Aspinal, Mbak Linda, and Indonesia Project for having me here. And for this update, um, I would like to present my research about the political economy of flood management in Indonesian cities. Uh, government officials everywhere, Global South and Global North, usually blame their poor flood management because of the climate change. They mainly argued that the existing pumping machine, retention ponds, and drainage channels could no longer handle the overflow of surface water because of the extreme rains. I acknowledge that the failure of the flood management in some cities might be impacted by these non-political factors, uh, such as engineering or machine, uh, machine failure. However, from my finding, it seems that it hasn't convey all of the explanation of the causes of the f success and failure of flood management outcomes. So I'm using the flood defense infrastructure as an entry point of analysis. Uh, I compare the political dimension in flood management in three Indonesian cities. Indonesia is one of the most disaster prone countries globally, frequently exposed to various geophysical and climate-related hazards. The increasing sea forces temperature contributed to the tropical cyclone intensity. Hydrometeorological hazards, such as landslide, floods, and uh, tropical cyclone, are predicted to be more frequent in the future. Last year, floods was the most frequent type of natural disaster in Indonesia. So flood cases have shown increase in intensity over the previous decade. So while geophysical disaster like earthquake have caused more death in Indonesia, flood is the, is the most significant among these risks because it occurs most often, affect most people, and causes most damage, especially in urban areas. So this research has a, this kind of question behind puzzles. However, although this flood is happening in many areas, many cities, but some cities relatively succeed, and while others fail to manage floods, as shown by the statistic of flood cases and number of impacted people. So how is it possible that cities operating within the same national context and confronted with a very similar problem of floods, but perform very differently in, in terms of the outcomes of flood management? 
and it becomes even more puzzling when we observe that cities that do not heavily invest in massive technical intervention turns out equally well or even better than cities that depend on such intervention. So the answer might be, must lie in the local politics of flood management, but what are these? So I would like to argue that the outcome of flood defense is also influenced by the existing political process. In this regard, existing power structure and ongoing political process play a crucial factor in shaping the city's ability to cope with floods. The success and failure of flood management depend on the varying regulatory enforcement capacity of local governments to set up and implement effective regulation of flood defense infrastructure. Local government whose policies regularly undermined by collusive relationship between state actors and economic elites are much less effective in building flood defense, especially through the effective management of drainage channels and waterways. And the opposite way, the local governments that are able to tame or bypass such this collusive relationship are relatively better to build effective flood defense. So before I uh, explain further about the findings, I should explain first about the nature of Indonesia flood defense infrastructure. So flood defense infrastructure in Indonesia relies on the assemblage of drainage system and waterways, as you can see in this picture. Flood defense infrastructure is, is a facility to maintain surface water flow through drainage channels to minimize the overflow that leads to the flood hazard. The flood defense here refers to not only drainage facilities that built by the government, such as canals, retention pond, and pumping station, but also the drainage facilities built by large private companies like real estate companies and factories as part of their responsibility which is which usually connected to this public infrastructure. In, in Indonesia, uh, the authority to manage drainage channels lies on the hands of local government. So the, the authority, including regulating the provision of drainage infrastructure by private actors to ensure the optimal operation of drainage network. For the case selection, I combine flood case statistics from the Indonesian disaster information data from the BNPB and EU uh, Global Surface Water to find cities that show flood trace intensity in the last 50 years, but show different trend in the last 10 or uh, 15 years. Also, coastal and inland watershed is taken also into consideration because mostly Indonesian cities are located in this geographical setting. So as you can see in this graph, Bandung and Semarang built many big infrastructure projects which cost hundreds of million euros in the last 10 or 15 years compared with Surabaya. But however, Surabaya shows impressive performance as shown by low level of flood cases and low number of impacted people. In comparison, Semarang and Bandung show less impressive performance as shown by high level of flood cases and high number of impacted people although already in equipped by installed large infrastructures. Bandung, in comparison with Surabaya, on, not only has invested very big of sum of money in flood management infrastructure, but also invested in terms of human capacity, particularly through the deployment of security forces to securing drainage channels and waterways. Because flood management in Bandung, Bandung District, part of the national program based on presidential decree 2018, part of the Citarum Normalization Project. So, uh, here we go. Uh, based on the uh, field of findings, the decline in flood case in Surabaya in line with the enforcement of regulation on drainage system usage by the local government. They don't hesitate to take action against violations that occur, even if they should confront a big business group. Sometimes the real, real estate managers, especially those owned by the large property tycoon reluctant to give access to check the drainage system. However, through the flooding task force, the Surabaya government always insists to entering the real estate area to inspect the existing drainage system. To delve deeper what is going on in the field, I followed uh, Surabaya flooding task force day by day. 
it is a street level bureaucrats that responsible to manage the flood hazard. From the very first day, he warned me that his works mainly 20% technical and 80% rest is non-technical. So my question is, why? what is the 80% non-technical? So it's like this. Yeah, this short video just only one would like to illustrate what going on in the field. This is owned by very one of the biggest real estate property in Indonesia, one of the oligarch, and as you can see, they didn't uh, build proper retention pond. Maybe they just only built like a fish pond, right? Very small and very, uh, very shallow. So uh, this man, this person inspected the uh, real estate and then asked to the manager to wider and deeper these uh, ponds. And their team will oversee the improvement day by day and people keep uh, following their works by the uh, digital uh, application. So that's done. And however, this kind of situation that happens in Surabaya, I couldn't find in other cities like in Semarang. Uh, Semarang government seems not seriously committed to enforce drainage regulations based on work findings. Uh, property companies in Semarang tend to refrain from fulfilling obligation to build and maintain drainage facilities as required by regulation. However, the Semarang government seems reluctant to confront big property companies they showed relatively less effort to impose regulation against the property companies. Thus, the existing public drainage system cannot accommodate surface water from the housing built by the real estate companies. The expectation for serious effort toward enforcing regulation are increasingly pessimistic when the highest level bureaucrats hesitate to deal with these companies. It's because they usually have strong political economy position and access. Big real estate developers often break the rules, such as not creating retention pond as required. And it makes the people, uh, kampung people who live outside of the real estate compound much more vulnerable from the flood hazard. As you can read from this quotation from high ranking of one of the local agency lead leader in Semarang. And also, uh, uh, apart from the real estate developers, Industries and factories have also violated drainage on the Chitarum River banks. Weak regulatory enforcement from the local government regarding violation of the drainage system committed by in industry also occurs in the Bandung district. To delve further about what actually happens in the ground, I followed community-based river patrol in Bandung district. They admitted that they were often intimidated by other state actors when monitoring factories suspected of dumping industrial waste on the river. There were also rumors that Oknum from the local government were colluding with factory owner. Industrial waste uh, without, proper pro uh, without proper processing disposed to the Chitarum River networks contributes to the river turbidity. This river turbidity is one of the factors that trigger the river overflow when the heavy rains happens. Now, explaining the uh, variation. From the empirical findings, cities whose local governments are relatively capable of enforcing regulation on drainage-based infrastructure, such as Surabaya, shows better outcomes on flood cases and number of impacted people than cities that less enforce the regulation, like Semarang and Bandung district. However, Regulatory enforcement seems more complex than the default formula of mainstream state capacity measurement. It includes the question of how we can explain the region within the state that lack of capacity element can enforce regulation. Indonesia is a middle economic country with a weak regulatory capacity as shown by the worldwide governance assessment. In Southeast Asia, Indonesia's score is lower than Malaysia in Singapore Indonesia on par with countries such as Thailand and Philippines. First explanation, the Surabaya case represents what scholar calls as a co-produced enforcement. 
This term explains that state society linkage improve regulatory enforcement. It is when we can find greater resources within state and progressive linkage between regulators and allies in the society. So the bureaucrats can use societal resource to supplement the state. This combination leads to the pattern of named co-produce enforcement. Second, lack of enforcement is not always caused only by the lack of state capacity. Not enforcing the law can also reflect the political choices by bureaucrats or politicians due to its potential benefits. The local political character in Semarang and Bandung district share a conducive environment for what's called, called as a forbearance. I will explain to the next slide. As we already discussed yesterday with Pak Mustafa, uh, the, I will uh, start first with Surabaya. The state society linkage is the main feature of Surabaya reform under Mayorisma. Uh, the linkage is crucial in the regulatory enforcement of flood defense. Where civil society is engaged in local governance, the government apparatus cannot easily collude with companies for violating drainage regulations. Moreover, a government that receptive a broader popular base can be more resp responsive to the needs of large, larger segments of society. In the case of Surabaya, the mayor mobilized against corruption by strengthening relationship with civil society actors and, refor and, re and reformist leaders and with the help of media to help broaden her base. This reform agenda resulted in a more effective, more just, and less expensive response. This coalition can limit the influence of predatory elites, including political business collusion, until the present day when Risma is no, lang no longer serving as mayor. Through the developed digital application, such as uh, uh, this developed by one of very influential local media in Surabaya, Sura, Suara Surabaya, the public could complain about city problems by uploading photos, text, videos directly to so, uh, the Suara Suraya, Surabaya mobile app. And every complaint uh, that Suara Surabaya channel receive can be directed directly to the Surabaya government 112 command control. So this directly go to the city hall. And the public could also monitor and follow up the uh, improvement uh, by the city uh, government by reporting it via videos or photo. In the case of flooding, uh, residents could report inundation and directly monitor the follow up carried out by street level official in the field. So the street level bureaucrats who are responsible to the floods cannot mind mind, cannot just, uh, they, they should serious, uh, uh, showing serious commitment to respond to the floods. Public monitoring like this contribute to securing the city government commitment to serving the public seriously. Yeah. Uh, in the op opposite way, the reluctance to enforce drainage regulation in, in Semarang is not because of the problems of financial posture or workforce from the bureaucracy, but because it seems more to uh, collusion between the politicians and business actors. Semarang is the fourth larger city and relatively sufficient local budget and will equip, uh, will equip bureaucracy. But with non-enforcement actions, politicians get material resources such as funding to win competitive election. As you can see in this picture, there's a rumor that the elector mayor has entangled in the controversy since his first term administration in 2014. Civil society actors regretted the mayor inauguration because it was suspected that he received illicit campaign funds. The rumor has it that some businessmen donated but were not included in the campaign finance report. They provide assistance in the campaign, such as facilitating transportation for the campaign supporters. For example, this company is suspected of being one of the campaign fund contributors for the elected mayor. This company several times involved in the violating drainage regulation related to the business activities, but was not subjected to the strict sanction by the local government. And Bandung similar also happens non in uh, and non-enforcement is in line with the political interest of the dynasty that uh, survived for two decades. And there was a rumor that this dynasty used, used to receive money from factories and industry owners operated in the Citarum watershed. They received funding from business actors to distribute resources to their supporters to win election. Moreover, in the Bandung district case, the arrival of another actor like the security forces like security forces made collusion difficult to be contained. Okay, to be conclude, 
Um, I would like. I just only would like to highlight that the flood is not only a natural cause. Flood also heavily connected with the political dimension. So the successful outcome of uh, flood defense infrastructure is not only caused by the technical performance, like engineering infrastructure and so on, but it's also determined by the state or local government capacity to enforce drainage regulation. More regular collusion for violating drainage uh, regulation occur, so the less successful the flood defense outcomes will be. And Conversely, if collusion occurs less frequently, then most likely the flood defense will be more successful. This study also proposed to rethink the mainstream understanding of flood defense infrastructure in the flood risk management toolbox that now amplified by the EU. Uh, infrastructure uh, for flood defense means not only refers to massive facilities such as canals or pump stations that built by the state, but more as a complex assemblage of interconnected different elements from public, private, or state and non-state domains. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. That, thanks very much. That was perfect timing. And um, there'll be a 30-minute question and answer session at the end of this uh, session. So please, please uh, hold your questions. And with that, we will move on to the next talk, which is Pak Yudis on uh, traffic policy responses to traffic congestion. Thank you, Pak OK, good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Indonesia Update, Pak Ed and Bulinda for bringing me here. But uh, the topic is quite heavy because it's about traffic congestion. And I would like to use Jakarta as the lesson for my uh, study now. See, <laughs> someone is laughing now. <laughs> okay, first of all, I would like to put the context about the Jakarta metropolitan area. Oh, sorry. So, uh, I think most of you guys uh, already know about Jakarta. Jakarta is the largest metro area in Indonesia but perhaps you may not know about how big is Jakarta. Jabodetabek or Jakarta metropolitan area is about 30 million, 31 million people living there. I think more than Australia, seven, uh, 26 or 27 people. And then, <laughs> and the, this 31, people, 31 million people living in only 11,000 kilometer square. So you can imagine that. And the size of Jakarta metropolitan area is about uh, five times of the Bandung metropolitan area. So imagine that uh, Jakarta is something like a primate city. It's much bigger than the second largest uh, metro area in Indonesia. And then uh, in the context of Jakarta in terms of national economy, we can see that uh, Jakarta is much more prosperous in the context of the GDRP per capita is much higher compared to Indonesia. One out of the 10 people in Indonesia living in Jakarta metropolitan area, indicating massive the demand for transportation. And we know that uh, on average in 2014 survey, commuter survey in Jakarta, uh, on average people need like 21.3 kilometers or about 64.6 minutes on average for commuting. Someone yesterday com uh, complaining about having commut commuting for 12 minutes in here, but in Jakarta, uh, 64 minutes uh, needed for one way. So for a written trip, you need two hours, and it's on average. And then the number slightly decreasing, just 5%, but the cost is increasing, partly, uh, be partly because perhaps for the rise of the right helix surface later we can see. And to put it in the context in the uh, other urban areas in the world, Jakarta is like ninth most congested city in Asia. Maybe some of you argue, no, maybe not ninth. And then in ASEAN, it is only second to Manila. It, uh, by TomTom -tom traffic index, uh, it stated that about 22 minutes and 40 seconds to pass first, kilometer, first 10 kilometers in Jakarta city. And I, I believe that some of you may not believe it. 20 kilo, uh, 10 kilometers in 20 minutes, come on. It may be one hour, in, uh, even more uh, during the peak hour. And then even maybe Jakarta is not ninth most congested city, maybe second, but uh, it's just because of the 
uh, COVID, maybe it's uh, better. So if you want to see Jakarta in the best uh, in the best way in terms of uh, uh, commuting around, then come during the COVID. <laughs> and then uh, the cost of traffic is about uh, 100 trillion rupiah per year. So you can imagine that the traffic is really bad in Jakarta. So why so, uh, the congestion is so severe in the uh, Jakarta metropolitan area? Uh, first, I would like to highlight how bad the congestion Jakarta is. On average, on average, one fourth of the commuter spends more than one, uh, 90 minutes to commute for one trip by uh, 2019. So on ev uh, uh, this uh, number means that uh, you need at least three hours for a return trip from your uh, home to your uh, working place. I myself spent three hours return from uh, Pamulang to Salemba every day. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same with Mas Mustafa, for sure. <laughs> and then this, this number is far away from other, uh, uh, other city like Surabaya, Bandung, and Medan, but still, I think those uh, uh, areas, Surabaya, Bandung, Medan, still uh, even worse compared to uh, Canberra, for instance. So uh, even though the other, uh, other cities uh, number is much less, but I believe that without proper measure to reduce congestion, I think the path will be go something like uh, Jakarta metropolitan area not right uh, nowadays. Why this happen? Standard theory say that for sure demand and supply imbalance uh, make this happen in Jakarta. Uh, for the table, we can see that uh, the ratio of network length for population, both rail and road, Jakarta is way behind the other mega cities. Put it in the context, uh, Jakarta having population like 31 million. Let's say we compare it with uh, Greater Tokyo, 32 million. But our ra uh, railways is just one fourth. Our station is just uh, yeah less than 10 percent, and then ridership of the for this uh, uh, railways is much low compared to Greater Tokyo. I think if we co uh, scrutinize the number uh, more. Uh, our number is still slightly better than Metro, Mali Metro Manila. Still, we, uh, Bangkok is still much better than us. And then, uh, as, uh, we also see that the, at the demand side, per capita income growing rapidly in Indonesia and uh, mostly driven by Jakarta and other metros. Now people easily uh, buy motorcycles. Uh, they, the down payment is uh, so low, almost sometimes it's like uh, one ten of the uh, regional uh, wage. And then there is also lower end cars like LCGCs, SUSCAR, and so forth, then people easily to access the uh, uh, private modes. And the last, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this trend makes massive change in the model split since early 2000s. I believe if you come in Jakarta like uh, 20 years back, you see that uh, you see something like what we have in this uh, flyer. There are many uh, Kopaja and so on. There is no Kopaja at all now in Jakarta. People save from Kopaja by uh, in 2000, in early 2000. Now it, uh, either using motorcycles or uh, Gojek or uh, like uh, uh, ride hailing uh, services. And then uh, to this trend, only uh, uh, concentrated in Jakarta, apparently no. We see that uh, this trend also happened in the other cities like uh, Surabaya, Bandung, Medan. More people relying on motorcycles. 50% people uh, commute using motorcycles. So uh, now if you see the road in Jakarta, Medan, and Surabaya, uh, many people keep using motorcycles with, uh, yeah, I don't know how to say it. Uh, uh, if they find macet, they use lawan arah, using the other uh, part of the road, making another chaos. And then uh, we also see that the, uh, the share of public transit users are part, uh, is relatively low, indicating that the lack of public uh, uh, lack of public transit in, in, uh, in, uh, investment. Now, we see that pu public bus is no longer option. What I mean in public bus here, like uh, Kopaja and so on, uh, the conventional public bus. In Jakarta, the share is declining over time, 
the presence of Transjakarta users increase, uh, uh, but uh, the share of other minibus or minibus, the conventional one, plummeting. Why? Because of the bus itself, the service is getting lower and lower. Schedule is, uh, there is no schedule. Uh, the service, uh, uh, unreliable service frequency. Maybe you know ngetem. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then the more, uh, the less people using it, the more ngetem they are. And then uh, we also see that the, the, the substitute good, the substitute mode is getting lower, uh, lower the, cost, the cost is getting lower. Motorcycle is cheaper, and then, and then in the last couple of years, we see that uh, more people using the rate hailing service. So people reluctant to use the bus because, the, uh, because of that the waiting time is so long, and this rate hailing service works as the complementary product for public transit, particularly for uh, the Transjakarta network. But is it that Jakarta is so desperate? But, uh, in a couple years, at least in the last decade, we see that the uh, public transport investment in Jakarta is uh, started. So there is a uh, improvement in public transport in a way that the, we have BRT starting for 2004, covering 244 kilometers, and I think now carrying more than 1 million passengers daily. Uh, there is also uh, improvement in commuter line. Uh, MRT just opened by 2019, but Unfortunately, it's uh, only serving like uh, 16 kilometers from Lebak Bulus to Buran HI. There are another three phases undergoing from uh, construction. Now the phase two is under construction, but another is still uh, on planning uh, process. And we just opened the LRT Jabodetabek two weeks ago. So maybe you find some of you uh, follow the, the news. Okay. Uh, on the commuter line, I don't know whether you some of you perhaps experience with the, uh, using the uh, commuter line in the top left. But uh, in early 2000, we can easily see that the, peop, uh, the, the commuter line is so overcrowded, but uh, by the end of 2000s, uh, the, the, minist uh, the Ministry of uh, Transportation tried to re uh, re uh, renovate this by having better service, switching the manual ticket to get, uh, automatic kit ticketing, Somehow it reduced uh, the issue of pickpocketing in uh, a commuter line. And then there is also uh, construction of double track, improving the, uh, imp uh, adding more uh, coaches, so it improved the quality of fleets and stations, and increased the frequency as well as the headway. And then another thing is uh, Transjakarta, the TG, Transjakarta. So for sure it's better, for, uh, better compared to the conventional bus, it have 14 main corridors operated, as well as a uh, feeder system connected, in, connected to the same area in the Jabodetabek. But uh, there is issues also because uh, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, Transjakarta, the BRT, use existing roads. So in early project, uh, it, uh, some of the line use the road cap existing road capacity up to 50% and uh, create uh, another uh, traffic jams in Jakarta. So, uh, but at, at the same time, I think, I don't know, but uh, Jakarta, uh, Indonesia, especially in Jakarta, people love uh, to build the highways. So uh, in, the last, uh, in the last decades, uh, since 2010, we built another 145 kilometer, almost double from the 78 until 2000 uh, development. Uh, basically, this uh, development partly, uh, mainly uh, built by the central governments. The local government con contribute none, and it's easy to build relative to uh, public other public transport like uh, MRT. Profitable, people pay the lanes, uh, and then. Uh, in contrast uh, for public transport, maybe the revenue is not there. And at the same time, uh, it's generally it's less complicated compared to, let's say, having a, a PPP for public transport like MRT. But uh, having this uh, more and more highways, particularly the George, Jakarta, Ottening Road, one and two, people now moving to the uh, suburbs, creating suburbanization process, sprawling, and at the same time brings congestion in the suburbs. 
So in 2000, the congestion is centered in the Jakarta area, but now it's like everywhere. And at the same time, uh, I think the government also seems to be more focused on the demand uh, policy. Some of you may be uh, quite uh, familiar with three, uh, three in one, high occupancy vehicle, so that you cannot pass the line except uh, you carry at least three passengers in your car. It was started uh, like from 92 and abolished by 2016 uh, because of its inefficiency, there is jockey that uh, you can hire uh, along, the la along the road and then you pay the jockey. And then it was uh, lifted, it was lifted, uh, replaced by odd even policy in 2016. Yeah, there is uh, evidence that the, the policy reduced the reduce the there is congestion, improving the travel time, but the effect relatively small. There is issue also that the nature of the policy is local, only improving some major roads, worsen congestion in other roads, and then at the same time, people buy more cars. Okay, so, so, what, so when suddenly people ask, so what is the solution? That's the most difficult part, I think. Okay. Uh, well, I uh, I would start with the uh, uh, for uh, for the there are many potential uh, explanation on the potential uh, uh, potential solution, but maybe I should start with the institutions. I think uh, one of the speakers yesterday talked about that how Jakarta metropolitan area is so fragmented in terms of the institution. We have 14 districts in Jakarta, but at the same time, people move uh, between the administrative borders. Consequently, we have different government, different interests, and then solving, and there is a tendency that solving on transport problems within their, uh, within their administrative area may create other issues. And at the same time, we cannot compare the capacity, financial capacity among these uh, districts. So Jakarta perhaps can generate much more money compared to Tangerang, compared to Depok, or even Bogor. And, uh, because this uh, lacks coordination, there is tendency that is tra administrative trying to solve its own public tra public tra uh, own transportation issue. Bogor City, I don't know whether Pak uh, pa Bima, pa Bima is not here. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, pa, pa Bima tried to revive the dead BRT system uh, by uh, having cooperation with the Ministry of uh, Transportation. With, but only with four corridors, uh, Bekasi will follow on, uh, on using uh, uh, BTS system, only uh, small corridors, and Tangerang also wants to use uh, another four corridors uh, using the BRT. But uh, given the size of, let's say, Bogor, Jack, uh, Bogor or uh, Tangerang, I don't, we don't think that the, this type of bus will solve the congestion problem, let's say, in Bogor or Tangerang. So the, the solution is practically limited, and then another issue is that now the, there is no service, minimum service standard for the transportation, giving that the municipality can define how their, uh, uh, how their policy toward the uh, transportation or their own tra traffic congestion issue within their uh, administrative area. And, but at the same time, we can see that if we, late, we are late to invest in public transport, the cost is going to be much higher in the next future. So solving this perhaps need multi-phase strategies. Rethinking the institutional setup can be a starting point. Uh, there is possibility that we may solve, sorry, the order might be slightly wrong. So perhaps having metropolitan area authorities may ease the intergovernmental cooperation with, uh, to provide urban service, particularly those who touch uh, urban service that beyond the administrative, administrative areas like uh, urban transport. So uh, to do so, what uh, the, the government can think about having the local public company as a way, uh, as the follow-up from the metropolitan area authorities, this company or Perumda can serve as the key factor and the uh, key actor in executing infrastructure projects. 
so coordination can be works between Perumda and Metropolitan Authority as well as the with the aligning ministry so that they can join to build like a new uh, massive uh, transport new massive public transports and then for, uh, along with the metropolitan area authorities the central and the government uh, local government can be shareholder of this Perumda and then the big deep, uh, the deepening source of financing can be another issues, so that the finance, for sure financing can be the issues, so that promoting private sector involvement can be one way to uh, promote better public transport in Jakarta or even other metro area in Indonesia. So the uh, the government, the, the Ministry of Finance, develop uh, various facilities for in, uh, to attract more public partner uh, public private partnerships in Indonesia from project development facility until uh, availability payment and at last I think the government should also think how to uh, maximize the land value capture because once an area is built by the uh, public transport then they will uh, the area will be uh, will get higher uh, price in the land so that how to capture it how to internalize it should be uh, one of the key factor to uh, to mobilize the revenue okay maybe I think I skip this sorry Max so to end my presentation we should manage our expectations <laughs> yeah so why I want to see us uh, I want to show this slide because even big uh, cities and in the in the uh, developed countries like London uh, or Paris, they face uh, congestions. So improving mobility does not mean we will see the dramatic, dramatic change from Jakarta to Canberra, for instance. It never happened, forget about it, okay? But I think uh, having better mobility for sure will provide more options for people, better uh, improving in quality of life, people, don't waste their time too much uh, in the traffic congestion in, in the road, but perhaps they, they can spend more time like uh, uh, in the productive uh, life. And so, uh, so the slides, uh, so sufficient, so that sufficient supply doesn't mean that we have no congestion. Maybe congestion shifting from road congestion to railway congestion like we have in Tokyo. Uh, so in the morning peak, we will face like full body contact uh, activity with the uh, other <laughs> other people. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, and I'm sorry for taking two more too much minutes, perhaps because of the congestion. Thank you. Uh, that was perfect timing, Patrick. Thank you. Okay, so this is the last part of the session by Ibu Aziza from ANU on uh, governing garbage. So it should be, should be very interesting. Um, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this session, especially because this is very early in the morning and it is still in the weekend. I left my house, my kids still sleeping. <laughs> And most importantly, thank you to Pak Ed and Pak Linda for giving me this opportunity to share my research. And also thanks to the committee and volunteers for managing this event really well. And thank you, Pak Phil, for sharing the session. So after listening to the flood and also a traffic problem, I will bring you to another problem in the city, waste problem. <laughs> so I will present my research on governing garbage. Uh, solid waste management reform in Surabaya city. So it's been a, a very popular city in the last two days in this uh, Indonesia update. So here are the Indonesian waste pack in 2021. Waste is a huge problem in Indonesia. Waste generation in that year was more than 34 million, year, uh, million tons. And if you look at the managed waste rate, it seems high, almost 65%. But this actually mostly means that the waste is transported and piled up in the landfill without treatment creating mountainous garbage. I believe not many of you have visited landfill to see garbage mountains. Whereas unmanaged waste pollutes the environment. Some of the waste goes to the rivers and oceans, 
And based on Jambek research in 2015, Indonesia produced around 1 million metric tons of plastic debris uh, per year, which end that ended up in the oceans, in the Indonesian oceans. And as the data covers only 289 regions, this means that the real waste problem is much bigger. Then, how do cities manage waste in Indonesia? Waste management is one of the decentralized authorities from the national government to local government. Therefore, its cities respond differently to this duty. In general, local government's capacity to govern waste is still low. Because of one, the absence of trained officials and under budget. And second, the lack of infrastructure and poor environmental awareness worsening the situations. Third, as I mentioned earlier, most waste in Indonesia is brought to the landfill without any treatment, such as uh, waste separation and covering with soil regularly, leachate control, and so on. Therefore, this creates further uh, problems that is over capacity and waste avalanche, for example. A catastrophic waste avalanche happened in 2005 in Lawi Gajah uh, landfill in West Java province, which killed around 140 people who depended on waste as their source of income, such as waste pickers and villagers who live near the landfill. And please look in these pictures that represent common waste problem at the landfills in many regions in Indonesia. The picture I took from Sindo News illustrates what has just happened at Sarimukti Landfill, a landfill in West Java province that serves as the final dumping site for four uh, regencies and cities, including Kota Bandung. There were garbage fire for almost two weeks last month. Another picture relates to Yogyakarta waste emergency which happened a few times due to a problem at Piyulungan landfill. And recently, the provincial government closed the one and only final dumping site for Yogyakarta city for one and a half month. This closure caused waste to pile up everywhere in the city, as you can see here. And this is, by the way, my city. And now, let me introduce you to Surabaya city. With population around 3 million in 2020, the city dwellers produce more than 2,000 tons of waste per day, in which, one, uh, 1 uh, sorry, in which 1,400 to 1,600 uh, tons of waste dumped at Benawa Landfill, the only landfill in the city. In early 2000, the city had a waste crisis, almost similar to what happened in Bandung and Yogyakarta City. This waste crisis became became the entry point to bring down the mayor at time, Sunarto or Anarto. And if you remember what uh, Pak Mustafa presented yesterday, Pak Mustafa, you helped me a lot, thank you. There were NGO activists uh, behind this political dynamic. There was another waste cri uh, crisis in 2010, in around 2010 and two, uh, 2012, as Benowo landfill was over capacity. And however, I then found that there has been a continuous effort to govern waste in the city, which made the city receive so many national and international awards for city cleanliness. And this led me to a question, how the Surabaya city government governed the waste problem? Now I will show you the waste reforms efforts in Surabaya. These pictures, I took both at Pusat Daur Ulang, or Material Recovery Facility, at Kelurahan Jambangan. It was developed by a CSR program from PT Unilever in 2001. And later, the city government took over the management of this facility, including providing operational fund. There are nine material recovery facilities in the city, which are able to reduce 40 to 50% of waste brought to this facility before the rest goes to the landfill. These pictures, show part of waste service provided by the city government. The city government uses compactors, uh, waste truck, they call it compactors like this, to collect and transport waste from temporary dumping sites, or TPS, and material recovery facilities to the landfill. Also, the government runs several comp uh, composting houses to process organic waste and turn waste to uh, compost. 
then the government then uses the compost to fertilize a public garden, and also the community can also take the compost for free. So it's kind of a, a circular economy here. And this green, clean, and well-managed public garden. It's not just usual public garden in Surabaya. Up to 2001, this garden, now called Taman Harmony, was a landfill, Kaputih landfill. So the landfill that caused the waste crisis in that year, then the government closed it, and then now they turn this, uh, that landfill into this garden. In 2021, President Jokowi inaugurated the first waste to electricity facility in Indonesia here at Benowo Landfill. So starting in 2012, after the second waste crisis, Benowo Landfill, the one and only landfill in the city, has been managed under a public-private partnership with the built-operate transfer model for 20 years. The private, partner, uh, the private partner is PT Sumber Organic. In this partnership, the private sectors invest in the construction costs of the facility and then manage and operate the landfill. While the city government provides the land and pays tipping fees, that's the fees the government has to pay for dumping the waste at the landfill. The electricity produced in the process belongs to the private sectors and becomes part of the profit for the private sector. The company claimed that they are now producing 9 megawatt electricity per day. At the end of the contract period in 2032, the building and facilities will be handed over and become government asset. And this picture, you see people in orange shirt. They are part of Pasukan Kuning or Yellow Task Force. Because initially the uniform in yellow color. They change into uh, orange. This task force were recruited as street sweepers to keep the street clean and other public areas in the city clean. The government has been recruiting street sweepers since 1987, and their wage paid by the government based on the minimum regional wage. So overall, Surabaya has been exemplifying best practice in waste management in Indonesia. The city receives like the Adipura Kencana, the highest rank in the Adipura Award, which was given to cities that can maintain city cleanliness and urban environmental management for three years in a row for several times, from 1992 to 2022. And only less than 10 cities in Indonesia had received the Adipura Kencana. And along with those awards, the city government also received so many international recognition for city cleanliness and green city, including from the United Nations Environment Program. Then what makes Surabaya city government able to manage uh, urban waste? This is what I found in Surabaya. The first one is a continuous leadership commitment. Second, the commitment is then used to mobilize resources, both formal resources such as local budget, and informal resources, including alumni, based networks, and rent seeking. And third, a strong citizen participation and civic activism, as well as corporate social responsibility program from private companies in the area. I will explain those in the next slides. So leadership is one important variable in waste reform in Surabaya. You can see here a picture of Burisma, are you from Surabaya, Pak? <laughs> yeah, uh, so this picture is picture of Burisma, my uh, mayor in Surabaya in 2010 to 2020. And she was able to mobilize the bureaucratic machine and citizen to carry out various programs related to city cleanliness. Before becoming a mayor, she was a bureaucrat in the city, and she was the head of the city cleanliness agency for years. However, long before her term, the waste reform also happened in 1980s under Mayor Purnomo Kasidi. He's a military doctor who has concern on sanitation and environment program, including waste management. It was under his term when the Yellow Task Force was established. And long before that, during the Dutch era, 
the colonial government provided waste collection and transportation service. The second variable is the form, uh, formal resources, that's the local budget. In the last few years, Surabaya allocates more than 400 billion rupiah per year. That includes budget for waste collection and transportation, tipping fees to pay to pay the sumber organic, and also honoraria for the yellow team and so on. The tipping fee is around 130 billion a year. And as comparison, in Yogyakarta city, my own city again, the government allocates only 9 billion rupiah per year to manage the landfill. And talking about waste revenue from waste levy uh, and la uh, land, land rent, the government received 47 billion rupiah per year. Here you can see the huge gap between waste budget and waste revenue, which means that the government subsidy for waste service is big. Other resources available in the city is experts and alumni based network, especially from the Technology Institute of Surabaya or ETS and Erlanga University. Those experts and academics have been working as consultant for the city government in designing and implementing waste reform in the city since 1980s. Also, lots of middle and upper level bureaucrats, including Burisma, are alumni of ETS. And this made the city government with, uh, listen to what those experts say, as I quoted here. Uh, this quote refers to the waste reform at the landfill. Because the gasification, or oh, this is the technology used in the landfill to convert waste to electricity, and landfill processes have started, there has been an addition of a team from ETS. And look at the, the one with yellow uh, alphabet here. Moreover, the city government said that, that was what was said by ETS would be followed. Jadi, they just followed whatever the ETS expert said. That's good though. <laughs> Another resource I found in the city is rent seeking and patronage, which resulted in the lack of transparency in the procurement and budgeting for the landfill. So this is what happened around the procurement process for the landfill in, uh, in 2009. So the procurement started in 2009, but no private company is interested. In 2011, the government opened the second uh, procurement attempt in which four uh, companies placed their bid. But then the, the winner is, was the PTS Sumber Organic or PTSO that offered gasification technology to turn waste into electricity. This company offered the highest tipping fee compared to other competitors in the procurement process, yet PTSO won. However, the procurement team claimed that PTSO won as the technology that company offers is the best option in the effectiveness for waste reduction. There was, uh, there was suspicion from some local politicians and NGO activists about this process that prompted the like, Aliansi Masyarakat Anti-Korupsi uh, Surabaya to report the case to Anti-Corruption Committee. You can see here the tanda terima. The Surabaya police followed uh, up on this report, but then the case was dropped to the insufficient evidence. However, up to today, there is still tug, and, uh, tug of war between the executive and legislative power in the budgeting for the landfill, especially to pay for the tipping fee. And now let's move on to the third variable. It's participation of the citizen, of NGO activists, and private companies through their corporate social responsibility. One of citizen participation in waste management is through Waste Bank or Bank Samba. There are uh, almost 300 Waste Bank in Surabaya, also one uh, Bank Sampa Indu or Central Waste Bank. And as you can see here in the picture, it represents a partnership between Bank Sampa Indu Surabaya and a CSR from, PT, uh, from PLN, the National Electricity Company. And as for the NGO activities, again, if we recall what was presented by Mustafa yesterday, he argued that civic activism was an important factor that drive political reform in Surabaya. This is also the case uh, in waste reform in the city. Apart from those three variables, and now I have to thank to Pak Abidin Kusnau for, for lending the base when he explained about critical junctures. 
I found that awareness toward waste issue in the city has started in 1920s, in which the Dutch government introduced government waste collection and transportation service provision following the cholera outbreak in that era. In 2001, there was a waste crisis, which negatively affected the most of the residents. Later, the waste crisis sparked a mass movement to remove the current mayor, that, uh, that mayor. Even though the waste crisis was not the only issue at the time, but this became a trigger, a trigger point to bring down the mayor. And this became a public memory that waste is an important issue in Surabaya. And again, there has been a strong social movement as well as social capital in the city, including in waste management. And based on Surabaya city waste practices, I think the dynamics of waste governance in Surabaya show the different modes of governing chosen by the city government to address the waste problem. The choice of strategy is shaped by the national policy context, the, objecti uh, the objectives to be achieved, the scope of waste governance, the resources required, and the response of the community and other stakeholders to the government's waste policy. And look, looking at Surabaya waste reform, I noted three points that we need to reflect on. The first one is the fact that modernization at the landfill or the waste to energy or to electricity might be the future trend in Indonesian city. However, this will have an impact on the in, uh, marginalization of informal waste actors like waste pickers and intermediate waste buyers, those who have been taking important role in recycling waste in the landfill. So what can we do to integrate the formal and informal waste system? Secondly, informal resources like corruption, rent seeking, and alumni uh, network might be a driving factor in pushing innovative policy to solve garbage problem. This form of informality provides resources for the government to develop and implement policy action toward garbage problem. Again, how can we study the impact of this form of informality in urban governance? What can we do about this? And lastly, despite current achievements in Surabaya waste reform, the Surabaya city government has been unable, actually, to reduce the waste generation volume. Most of the reforms are targeted to manage waste, not to prevent waste. If this continues, more resources will be needed to tackle waste problem. Therefore, we do need to think about what can we do about waste growth prevention policy, and what can we do to raise awareness in uh, waste prevention. So this research helps me to realize that doing research relates to waste really need a strong nose. <laughs> Especially if you need to gather data at the landfill. I did that many times. <laughs> or to take picture uh, behind the compactors like this. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank the speakers for keeping the time. It really made my job easier. Thank you very much. They were all all very interesting talks, and so that gives us 30 minutes for a, uh, a question and answer session. Uh, does anyone want to start off? Uh, we've got a question over here. Uh, I thought there was one over here. No? Oh, yeah, please, please. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks to the, all the speakers. Uh, I have a question for Bu Aziza. Uh, I was wondering, uh, we often see uh, waste management in cities in Indonesia intertwined with discourses around Ketertiban. Uh, and I note, for example, uh, Bu Rizma, who's gotten a lot of really positive uh, descriptions over the past couple of days, uh, has, was involved in, in significant um, Pungusuran and evictions of street traders. I'd, I'd wondered if you'd seen intersections between waste management and other forms of social management in cities, for example, dislocations of, of informal settlements and, and other uh, such communities. Thank you. Uh, 
threes, okay. Uh, okay, there, there was one over here, and there are there are two couple of people here, Pabudi and so we'll take this one over here first. Um, hi, my name is Max. Um, thank you for all the speakers' presentations. They were wonderful. Um, my question is also for Ibu Noraziza um, about the waste management. Uh, you mentioned briefly at the end that most of the management was precisely that management of waste, but not really focused as much on prevention. And I was just wondering where a lot of this waste comes from in the first place. Like, are there global sort of waste transference factors at play? Um, or sort of how does that whole side of the issue play out? Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the presentation. So it seemed to me that uh, all the three speakers uh, suggest uh, if I look at this problem is as a problem of uh, common property, that the way to solve is, is using government, uh, good government, uh, not government, but government, exactly, in which there is an alternative, isn't it, in theory, that we could actually assign to private sector. And it doesn't seem to me that uh, you uh, provide a room for a private sector uh, much bigger role in solving this uh, issue of uh, uh, common property. Thank you. Okay, so those are three questions. So we'll, we'll go to the answers, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for many questions for me. <laughs> but Ian, so I will tell you a secret. Burisma did not like waste pickers. He did not like street vendors. He did not like those informal activity because it's totally un uh, not in alliance with city aesthetic. So what's the most important for Burisma is the city aesthetic, actually. That's why uh, during the, the modernization of the landfill, he then affected so many uh, thousands of uh, waste pickers from the area. And they were marginalized, they were put aside. Uh, even at the Koputi landfill, the, the old landfill, there was actually thousands of uh, waste pickers in the area before, but then they are gone now. Um, some of them, they, they're still in Surabaya in the fringe area, but that's actually the case. So, uh, Bu, Bu Burisma uh, is actually is so strict about um, city cleanliness, about uh, greenery. Even she will, she would call it Pak Lura. Uh, if there is some RT, do not uh, compete in a clean uh, kampung competition for green and clean, for example. Or if there is a, the waste truck is not the paint is quite faded away, and she saw that, she would just call the driver and ask in on the spot to just repaint the waste rack at that time. So that's for her. And for the, what, where the waste come from? It's from us. Come on, we produce waste. And uh, based on some, um, based on research just recently, uh, the city dwellers individually produce around one, uh, 0 0.7 kilogram of waste per day. And that's the reality. That's the reality, and not many people are aware that they are part of the problem. So uh, then I, then why? What's the role of the non-government? So actually, but in my research, it's uh, what I present today is only a small part of my research. For my bigger uh, picture, I actually did my research on the interlinkage between formal and informal waste system, in which I also uh, discuss about the role of informal waste system, for example, and like bank sampah, and so many actors that actually involved. But I, all, I still have um, believe that the government is the duty bearer because uh, it's part of the decentralized authority. And yeah, if you are talking about resources to solve this problem, it's very big. So it's only the government who has that. Or even, of course, the government can have a par partnership like what has been done in Surabaya, but to some extent, somehow, it actually, you know, 
include rent seeking, corruption, and those kind of uh, informal resources. Thank you. Okay, I, I think there was another, there are, are two questions on this side. So this, this fellow has been waiting quite a long time, I think. Can we do him for? Yeah, we would like to respond yeah. to Babudi. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's See, a bit more Babudi response. looking at you. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, 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 on the question from Babudi about why we don't see any or much uh, involvement in private partnership or private entities. I think the case of transport, let's say for MRT, the, uh, the way we build it is involving the private one, but we, I don't think we have, our regulation don't have enough space for the private to entirely operate the system. Something like we will see in Tokyo, for instance. In Tokyo, we see many private. Why? Because their revenue is not depending on the ticketing, but the way they can manage to uh, develop the surrounding area of the station. That's the part why the, uh, the, uh, the, the best part of this uh, building of the public transport. In Indonesia, I think we don't have enough capacity, or I don't know whether I'm not clear yet, but I think partly because of the uh, the, because of the undang-undang regulation doesn't allow the private to have like a, a combining between uh, surf, uh, work as the uh, public transport entities and the developer around the uh, around the uh, station. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, room for private actor in the uh, flat case. Actually, that um, this is maybe the origin of the problems. <laughs> Uh, why? Because uh, based on the regulation on drainage, uh, th this is happens in many cities in, in Tunisia that the real estate property, when they conducted less use conversion, more than five hectares, they, they should uh, build proper uh, retention ponds and drainage channels to compensate the water absorption. But mm, many times these big real estate properties, they hesitate to build this proper uh, drainage f uh, 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 so 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 it 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 makes uh, people that live in the outside kampung more vulnerable to the flood hazard. So I think the problem I mean, in in flooding it's uh, because the facilities are not only responsible uh, for the uh, state to provide, but also for the private entities such as the real estate companies. And uh, until today, many big uh, real estate property hesitant to build the proper uh, f such uh, facilities. Thank you. Okay, I, I did want to remind online participants that there is a Q&A box on Zoom, so you can submit questions through that. Can we, can we just get this one uh, fellow who's got the question? Uh, he's been waiting a long time, so we'll do that yeah. first. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is James Julvan. Uh, I'm a G20 scholar from UNSW Sydney. And yes, uh, this is very interesting. So uh, maybe the question for uh, Ibu Nur and Pa Yogi. Uh, so I came from Bandung. Uh, so I experienced the, the, the three problems that presented today, uh, daily uh, issues in, in Bandung. So uh, you have shown us the best practice from Surabaya, which is good. Uh, but why is it so hard for other cities to uh, replicate the same uh, good approach to uh, their problem? Uh, especially by the uh, uh, local authorities, maybe because we, everyone knows that they also have done uh, like the comparative study trip, like the study bonding trip. It's uh, still frequent, but uh, we have not seen like the improvement. So, what is the main factor that uh, prevent or uh, make the other city have less maybe willingness and action to do the same uh, like Surabaya? Thank you very much. I think there was one other question on this side, and then we'll go. Then we'll do the online ones. And, yeah. Check, check. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pa Phil. Uh, my question is actually really connected to the last one. So I am Eki, also from Bandung. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to explain more, you know, like specificity uh, on the question. Like, um, I have a question, of course, for Banur especially. 
Um, thank you for your presentation, Ba. It's not only interesting, but really uh, relate to what is happening uh, in Bandung. And also important, yeah, I think because Bandung is so close from Jakarta, it's been a um, tourist destination and also central government meetings destination, right? <laughs> so rubbish, garbage is, will always be a problem and also traffic congestion, Maseli, in Bandung, right? As you probably know. So I think the first point, continuous leadership commitment, yeah, especially uh, in Surabaya case, uh, Surabaya had uh, Burisma, right? So, so probably that's that's uh, a very important thing. But we don't see anything like that <laughs> in Bandung. Um, as you know, yeah, our last mayor passed away, right? Bandung's last mayor passed away, replaced by the vice mayor who is now jailed, right? Because of corruption. <laughs> Together with the top official of local transportation office, Maseli. <laughs> So that will relate to the congestion, right? So we don't really see any solution for Bandung. It does not really good, right? Uh, and then we have a temporary mayor who is also being investigated for the same corruption. So Bandung so is practically you, in a autopilot mode. Yeah, it's, it's getting a bit long. Can, can you? Can oh yeah, you, okay, can sorry. <laughs> so I think if the, 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 if, the, if the answer is leadership, I don't think that will, you know, probably solve the problem. And also one more thing, uh, we don't really uh, see we, we, we really We really need to move on. Right. There are a lot of other people uh, want to ask On questions. coordination, we, because Bandung does not really uh, have uh, uh, within boundaries uh, waste management facility. So, Banur, okay. what do you see of that? Okay, okay, okay. We'll, we'll have to move on. We'll have to move on. I, I want to get one online question and then we'll come. Oh, yeah, just one online question. They'll answer and I will come back to you. Okay. Online question? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, so, currently we have 100 plus plus uh, uh, people streaming online. Um, there's a lot of questions, but one question from Laila Alfirdaus from Universitas Diponegoro, Semarang, uh, specifically to Mas Yogi. Um, Semarang is relatively colossus, but Handy is dominating. Um, being a single candidate in local elections and won high votes, could you please give us a picture of how this puzzle is shaped, is shaped in the so-called politics of disaster policy? Um, can I have another? Okay. Okay. <laughs> So there's a one question from Zani Gobels from University of Queensland. Um, Thomas Yogi, again, uh, do you distinguish between tidal flooding such as that, that caused by ongoing land subsidence in northern and western Semarang and other types of flooding events? And second to Manur and also Mas Yogi, I'm wondering if there is any ongoing work in Surabaya exploring links between success in addressing flooding and managing waste that blocks drains. Thank you. Okay, we'll give them a chance to answer and then I'll come back to, to you. Okay, who wants to? Uh, Maybe me? Yeah. Check. Yeah, thanks. I would like to respond to the uh, online question why Handy is so popular. So I think it's a very interesting question, yeah, because it um, represents now the trend in many uh, local government local uh, government leaders in Indonesia. They they uh, build their own persona through their own social m social media. So Handy use uh, his own Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to respond every uh, comment, every complaint from the uh, citizen in the city. So it's quite different with the Surabaya because Surabaya use not personal account of the social media of the mayor, but use the independent commercial media to respond to every complaint from this citizen. So it is very handy, from my uh, opinion, could be very popular because they know that uh, he can amplify, he can use uh, his persona through his own pers uh, social media to complain. So it's like this is kind of clientelism 4.0, right? Using the uh, IT to like, okay, I I'm like uh, the Santa Claus to will we'll, we'll respond to every problems and, and it is where you should uh, complain to me, but not as a uh, entity, as a in, in the uh, local mayor uh, in institution, but as a personal. So I think that's become problem actually. And uh, why it's so difficult to replicate the Surabaya um, performance in the floods? Uh, 
management to the uh, other city like Bandung. So like I already explained, so the social political dynamics, it's the contextual driver behind that. So it's like in a city that you can find the strong uh, state societal linkage, the improvement toward the flood management, it can be easily happens. If you compare with the city that you cannot find the strong state, uh, state society linkage. And, and, and my definition about state society linkage is not on, it's not always the coalition uh, between the uh, state and the civil society activists, but more to give room to the public voice. I think because uh, the civil society activists have so many works to do, maybe they also quite tired, but if, if you rely on the public voice, it's ca kind of give weapon to every people to complain, protest, uh, and, then, and then if you already find the channels that go directly to the inside the city hall, it can be very effective. What next? Yeah. Um, uh, is there any uh, question that I miss? Okay. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. In uh, especially in Semarang, it's quite now. Yeah, in the mainstream uh, geographical or mainstream disaster studies, it should be like. There's this kind of distinct, they try to distinguish between the tidal floodings and the river floodings. But in, in Semarang, somehow it's quite entangled because Semarang is the, Semarang location is the co north coastal city. And sometimes the, um, when, when the tidal uh, flooding happens, the r uh, river uh, stream uh, cannot go to the uh, ocean uh, well. So it's like combination between the river flooding and tidal flooding that makes uh, flooding in Semarang is very difficult to be contained. I think. Thank you for the questions. Um, why is it difficult to replicate Surabaya case? Yeah, even in my city in Jogja, I have Sultan Mas. <laughs> 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 but still, it's even in my city, <laughs> I am academic. Uh, I'm academics from Gajah Mara University, but still, still. <laughs> the problem again, uh, but again, this is the, that's why I highlight the importance of leadership commitment. And what I meant as a leader here is actually not only from the government leader, but also if, again, if we remember what Mustafa said yesterday, the uh, NGO activist is also the key. Like in Jogja, there, was, there are lots of uh, bank sampah. It was moved by NGO activists. It was moved by volunteers who, want, uh, who wanted to make the, the area clean. And it's happened. But of course, the, the, what's it, the speed of those movements compared to the speed of the way we produce waste is, you know, like the earth and the sky. That's why um, I highlighted in my um, reflection that we really need to think about how to deal or how to, how to shape waste prevention policy to work it better. And that's my, uh, hopefully it, uh, it answers your question, but don't worry, I think Bandung has a very strong social activism too, and we still have hope on that. <laughs> like Jogja. Like Jogja. <laughs> I remember uh, during the waste crisis in Jogja, I got called some from some colleagues in, in my city and Aziza, can you give me some suggestion? And I just said, oh, come on, even the Sultan cannot solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and how can I? I'm just the crumbs, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the problem. So, but again, I, what I'm a leader here is not the government leader, but we can also talk about the um, NGO activists or other community leader. And is there a connection between waste management with flood management like in Surabaya? I didn't really uh, did a research on that, but in Surabaya, the, the management of the cleanliness is also include the rivers. So in every week, um, the city government through the, now it's part of the, uh, what is it? Environmental agency, Dinas uh, Lingwan Hidup, they clean the river. Routine, very routine. Use like uh, so many uh, hard vehicle, they will just uh, remove uh, waste and uh, other rubbish from the river. And I think that's also 
contribute to the, the, ma uh, the way, uh, flood management in the city. Thank you. Okay. There was one, one more question over here from the floor. Is there a microphone for this lady? Okay. Hello, good morning. I'm Elisa from Jakarta. My question will be for Paheli because it's about Jakarta and about traffic. So usually in mobility, we have uh, either we use concept called avoid, shift, improve, or push on and pull demand, uh, push and pull factor. Uh, I'm just wondering why uh, in your proposed solution, uh, is there any reason why you didn't put uh, anything that relate to reduce driving? As it, uh, yeah, okay, that's all. Let's do this one more on the floor and then we'll go to the online questions. Hi, my question is also to you this, to make it even. Um, <laughs> also about transportation in Jakarta. Uh, the, um, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering about public transportation. Actually speaking of awards that uh, Buaziza mentioned given to Surabaya, Jakarta actually already received award for its public transportation in 2021. And it's the first ever Southeast Asian city that received such award. And I'm, <laughs> So, uh, the award, just to be sure, uh, is given by the International Transportation and uh, Sustainable Transportation. It was given in Washington, D.C. And so, um, my question here, how much is actually the, um, the, uh, the challenge of sort of like improving public transportation usage in Jakarta is actually created by the lack of public transportation versus the impression that Jakarta has no public transportation because I feel that there is a combination of it that there are so many like shared, uh, I don't know, some assumptions that public transportation in Jakarta is non-existent or bad, but actually if we look around, there are so many options out there. So has there been any survey about what actually causes all these choices of transportation mode, uh, as well as the kind of land use scale? Is it really, you know, is it seems that Jakarta is uh, in, in, in the rankings, it surely is compared to London, Tokyo, in, it's comparable, right? The commuting pattern during the rush hour. So is, it, is this it, you know? Is there something that has to do with also the land use and the distribution of the scale, you know? The sheer scale of Jakarta, how much further can it improve actually with this scale if, we co if we're going on this way? Thank you. Okay, let's do one online question, please. Okay, so we have one question from Ji Won Kim from John Hopkins University, participating from Baltimore, um, to Manur Aziza. What do you think to be the motivations that drive CSR into waste reform? And what are the industries that are most active in waste reform through the CSR projects? Thank you. Okay, so we'll let you guys answer those. And then there are a couple more, I think, that we'll try to pick up in the next, uh, yeah, so try to make it you know, relatively brief because there's some more questions. Okay, thank you. So initially I thought, okay, there is no questions, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I tried to answer her question from Mbak Elisa and uh, Mbak, siapa tadi? Mbak Rita, okay, Mbak Rita, uh, jointly. I believe that this answer will not satisfy you well, but uh, <laughs> why? Uh, in my proposal, why I'm not, I'm not including the push and pull demands? Well, I think the issue here is that uh, having, for sure, that, that kind of uh, policies like uh, including that, okay, why don't you just in, uh, put it there, uh, invest more in public transport? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's part of the strategy. But I think as long as we cannot see the Jakarta, something like Jakarta as a whole, so, like people like myself, like Pak Mustafa from Pamulang, from Tangsel, go to uh, Jakarta every day. So that we need a transportation network that beyond the administrative border. Then I don't think Jakarta uh, itself or even Depok Bogor will can solve it by themselves. So in that sense, maybe. Uh, some of you uh, noticed that uh, our MRT stop in Lebak Bulus, in the southern part of Jakarta. It started there and then uh, it ends like uh, in the central part of Jakarta. Why is not covering uh, beyond uh, uh, Lebak Bulus, southern Jakarta, connecting uh, Tangerang or even connecting Depok? Why? Because it's part of the uh, local uh, Perumda, local uh, 
national national uh, no, sorry sub national company and uh, they cannot extend it uh, beyond their jurisdiction so that's the issue that i want to bring here that uh, we have to solve this because some of public uh, some of urban service issue in uh, jakarta uh, in indonesia something like jakarta cannot be solved uh, uh, within the border area administrative area it should be solved uh, beyond that administrative areas so i think uh, first thing first once we have uh, innovation like in, in institution then I, I believe that uh, having this cooperation better not only uh, coordination but cooperation building it together beyond this uh, beyond this uh, administrative area may solve partly solve the problem for sure there is no con uh, there is no way we have don't have congestion but it's better uh, <laughs> transport uh, be better uh, uh, traffic uh, traffic in in Jabodetabek in Jakarta metropolitan area so uh, for the Mbak Rita, yeah. Well, I, I, I personally just know that uh, we got the award in 2021. Yeah, uh, 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 I don't think that, uh, sorry, my point is that, uh, yeah, Jakarta still have uh, improvement in public transport, but I think in my point of view, the, the current uh, state, we have to, much uh, tr uh, waste wasting resource in roads too much uh, congestion so that the uh, people on average uh, need like three hours uh, for uh, two under three hours for congestion and it's spent in roads i think perhaps if we have better public transport in railways i think uh, it will be much better so that uh, we we for sure the the, the congestion is uh, moving from road to uh, railways but i think it will be better for the uh, si uh, city like jakarta with the size of 31 million maybe that's uh, uh, my answer uh, thank you for the question ji won kim sorry if i misspell your mispronounce the name so why csr interested in uh, doing out, out being part of the waste management so i interviewed um, uh, like a representative, like there is, there is an association of companies who uh, has program on waste management. Uh, I interviewed uh, one of them, and they said that they want to involve in this program in the waste management program. First, I just uh, uh, broadcast what they said. So the first, of course, is part of the the responsibility because uh, part of the uh, responsibility to bring uh, to give back to the community but of course it's much bigger than that it's about branding it's about branding because and if I follow it correctly uh, among many companies who are interested in joining the waste management program mostly multinational companies which uh, in the uh, main company they already follow the policy from the state they are in. Like Unilever, can I mention brand here? <laughs> <laughs> like Unilever, Danone, um, like Coca-Cola and, and so, they have the CSR program on waste management simply because the central office said so. So uh, that's again, this part of the obligation from the central, gov the central office. But also it's part of the responsibility because apparently in, uh, they have a very big market in Indonesia. And in Indonesia there is actually a regulation that pushed the all companies to have like what so-called as extended so, uh, producers responsibility. Uh, the actually the law was established in 2008, but it was only implemented in 2021. And up to that year, it's only around 119 companies uh, submitted their roadmap for, for risk prevention program to the Indonesian government. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna, I'm afraid we're gonna have to stop now. We're over time. So uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get some of the questions. There were some online. There was another one at least from the floor. We're gonna have to stop. Uh, we're now ready for morning tea. It will be served outside. And I need to ask you to please return, try to return by 10.50, the next session We'll start at 10.50, so please try to return to your seats by then. Thank you.
Oh, no. Dear speakers and participants, may I have your attention? Please um, find your seats ASAP as we will uh, begin in, in two minutes. <laughs> Right. Welcome back, everyone. A very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us uh, today. Um, welcome back those joining online too. As we commence, I want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australian, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people from whose traditional lands the ANU campus rest and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to session six, the new urban land landscape. I'm Eva Nisa, a cultural anthropologist at the School of Culture, History and Language, College of Asia and the Pacific, the Australian National University. Um, I hope you enjoyed your morning tea. I, ho I hope you feel more energized after having your tea and coffee. <laughs> right, um, as you can see from our program, the session will feature presentations from three wonderful speakers. We have Corey Alida, Ian Wilson, and also Rita Padawangi. And before the presentations begin, allow me to in introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Corey Alida. Corey Alida is a freelance writer and also self taught urbanist. Um, she studied English literature at Universitas Gajah Mada in Yogyakarta. Um, her passion for urban issues began during her time as a journalist at the Jakarta Post. After five years in journalism, Corey embraced a new challenge in urban and spatial planning policy. She became a project manager at the nonprofit organization Jakarta Property Institute which focuses on affordability and livability issues in Jakarta. Currently, she balances her role as a freelance, freelance writer with running her family, family's business. Sounds like a very fun project. <laughs> um, it's now my pleasure to welcome our very first speaker, Mbak Eli, Mba Cory Elida. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to say thank you for Indonesian Update, uh, especially for Ad and Belinda, for not only the opportunity, but also for the guidance. So I can stand here to share some stories about Jakarta's neighboring city, uh, South Tangrang, uh, the home of middle class. Maybe some of you have heard about South Tangrang, or often called Tangsel. Uh, for its big housing complexes such as BSD City or Bintaro Jaya. As you can see uh, from my title, the presentation will discuss about how middle class who live in gated communities provided and served by private developers, like in BSD and Bintaro, feel more like a consumer rather than a citizen. So, how does it happen? As we all know, that the urban uh, population in Jakarta and other big cities uh, is increasing over the years. However, the increasing number of working force is not balanced with the number of the decent places of living. The government doesn't really do anything, actually. <laughs> no control over the land price and no supply for the middle class. Because having a home in a city center is already out of the questions, uh, the workers who already work for a few years or getting married, usually first home buyers, will look for an alternative. Uh, the, the areas that are farther than Jakarta but have uh, access for commute daily. Uh, South Tangrang is one of the choices. Here is when private developers come to the pictures to take the opportunity, of course. They usually acquire massive lands of lots 
in the areas, and to catch the middle, com middle class market, they built gated uh, communities to ensure safety and give the sense of as exclusivity as well as flashy uh, infrastructure such as uh, for pub public facilities. So middle class who move out from Jakarta will still feel like living in Jakarta. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what are the implications of this massive development of the gated communities in the urban areas? I will discuss, sorry, okay. I will discuss uh, how the development creates infrastructure and public facilities gaps in the areas developed by the developers uh, and the one that are taken care of by the local government. And I will also discuss about the impacts of these gaps, which are creating political uh, so and socioeconomic gaps. Okay, why bother move out from Jakarta? Of course, we cannot afford it. There are two factors, uh, push and pull factors. The push factors is Jakarta doesn't have adequate supply for all the residents. It currently suffers from 1.38 million of housing backlog. And Jakarta is also unaffordable. As you see in the graph, from the property price to income ratio, Jakarta is even more expensive than expensive cities in the world like Paris, London, Singapore, and Tokyo. So if you have a house in Jakarta, you're like super rich. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the pool factors is the type of the house. This is very important for Indonesian. The only affordable option for middle class in Jakarta is apartment. However, apartment, apartment is not attractive at all. The first one is uh, the first one, most affordable apartment in Jakarta has small rooms. For example, 25 square meters with two bedrooms. Imagine that. <laughs> the second one, the ownership of the apartment is also temporary for only 80 years. The third one, which is the turn off for many home buyer, is there, there are many legal cases such as stalled development, violation of tenant rights, refusal of management handover, embezzlement, high cost and maintenance and services. My job in my previous office was to advocate people to live in vertical housing, but I personally chose landed houses. <laughs> and the last one is, unless you buy the expensive ones, the design of apartment in Jakarta is just sad. Yeah, many people who have tried to live in apartment feels like secluded and claustrophobic. And then, therefore, many young middle class still prefer landed houses, no matter how far it is from the city center. Landed houses are more familiar, although small, you still can build more with the remaining land plot, permanent ownership, still know your neighbors, although they rarely chat, actually. <laughs> And the concept of having a small garden to do during weekend is kind of American dream with a white picket fence for young middle class in Jakarta. <laughs> the other full factor is of course mobility. Tangsel has both public and private transportation infrastructure, commuter line and toll roads. Especially for the commuter line serving Jabodetabek, it is being reformed in 2014, it becomes more reliable public transport. Now let me introduce South Tangerang. Yeah. <laughs> the city of <laughs> residentials. <laughs> As Pak Mustafa said, auto, uh, autopilot city. <laughs> it's located in South and West Jakarta. South Tangerang is a new city. It's way younger than its housing complexes. It's kind of teenager now, so 15 this year. <laughs> With the size of 164.8 uh, square kilometer, with the population of 1.8 million, it just had three mayoral elections, and all are won by Ratu Atut Dynasty, <laughs> an infamous political dynasty that rules Banten. Who does, doesn't know them? It is a home of three big housing complexes: Bintaro, BSD, and Alam Sutra. I will only discuss BSD and Bintaro and other small, uh, smaller complexes because Alamstra is the upper class. So we can leave them <laughs> alone. <laughs> so 
So uh, I will sh show you, you know, very shocking uh, pictures. This is what South Tangerang looks like. It has 1,160 housing complexes. You know the yellow one? They are all residentials. Yeah, you can imagine. Their biggest uh, revenue is from uh, building transfer, transfer fee uh, uh, taxes. The yellow stripes are residential and the, yellow, uh, the black one is commercial services. Now I will uh, introduce you to the, to the gated communities. The first one is Bintaro Jaya. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody live in Bintaro, I believe. <laughs> Bintaro Jaya was one of the oldest housing complexes founded in 1979. Uh, it is uh, divided by sectors uh, in 1,000 hectares of land plots. Uh, aside from one of the most prestigious housing complexes, uh, as it is the closest one to Jakarta, uh, Bintaro is, uh, is also well known for its high quality schools. As this, the house is getting more expensive and affordable, Bintaro Jaya now is an aging community. <laughs> so Payerman doesn't have young friends, I believe. <laughs> But they built some apartments to cater younger uh, buyers. <laughs> the second one, and the biggest one, is Besde City. It's intended to become not only housing complexes, but a full flat city in Indonesia. It is founded in 1989. If Pabidin Kus know that it's the start of neoliberalism of housing supply, this is the monument, I believe. <laughs> BSD encompasses of total around 40,000 houses with a total number of population 400, uh, 450,000. It's head to head to Canberra, right? Canberra is about 400,000, right? So you can imagine how big BSD city is. And Sinar Mas land, the developer keep acquiring land and building. They expanded to Tangerang Regency right now. Besides its complete, completed facilities, BSD is well known for its modern grocery markets, uh, Passport, Passport Modern, and private university. Even Monash University franchise is in BSD. <laughs> so you get very familiar. And the rest is, we call it free riders, not me, the urbanists who in, invented the words. Freeriders is the term urbanists created to explain the phenomenon of many smaller housing complexes around Bintaro and BSD. They are massive and will keep mushrooming over the years. Between 2008 to 2014, South Tangerang government gives at least 450 permits for these housing complexes. They are typically small gated communities consisting less than 15 houses, enclave in kampungs, and this developer will use the facilities in Bintaro and BSD to market their units. Smart, right? <laughs> this is one of the free riders. Uh, sorry. This is built by Chiputra. It just built. It's near Bintaro. It started from 1.5 million uh, billion, if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what South Tangerang looks like. its residents. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> so who lives in Bintaro and BSD, you are fine. <laughs> this meme actually explains everything about the infrastructure and public facility gaps. And it's viral in 2020. Some of the candidates use it for, you know, uh, uh, for the campaign. And this uh, narrative often becomes a joke and a discussion in social media and daily conversation. Another term they use is public and private tangsel. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this meme depicts everything. I will show you some of the examples of these infrastructure and facility gaps. This is an obvious one. This is Pondok Ranji uh, train station. And this is also Pondok Ranji train station. The difference is the entrance door. The left one is uh, connects to the non-gated communities. And the right one 
obviously to Bintaro. <laughs> so this is private and public tangsel in one picture. And also the other one is roads. BSD and Bintaru roads are typically big, well maintained, while outside are smaller, disorderly, and usually takes time forever for the local government to fix it. The traffic light in the right picture is not functioned. It's a miracle there's no traffic accident there. The other one is water, the very basic. While well, Tangsel government sell raw water to BSD and Bintaro to spoil their residents to, with tap water. Yes, a tap water is a luxury in Tangsel. The coverage of tap water outside these two is only 12%. Yeah, it's far. These are a few of infrastructure gaps that I can easily show by pictures and graphs. However, the gaps are all in kinds of infrastructure and public services, including schools, hospitals, even markets. The superiority of the facilities provided by giant developers in BSD and Bintaro has resulted a perception among middle class who move to Tangsel, they, they do not need the local government as long as their need, uh, daily needs scattered by the private management. The, the ones who live in free rider communities also think that the same. As long as they have access to the facilities in BSD and Bintaro, they're safe. Some do not even bother to change their IDs to Tangsel IDs. <laughs> One of the residents said, I'm not a citizen. I'm a consumer who lives in BSD. My relations are between consumer and developer. I do not have the sense of citizenship. And this statement strengthened by low political participation. Uh, in 2020 mayoral election, the participation of Tangsel eligible voters is only 60%. It increases by 4% actually from the previous general election, but still low. Hence, although Tangsel has high human development index, it's not correlated, uh, correlated positively to the political participation. During the research, I found four types of gated community residents. Type one, do not have Satangrang ID. Type two, have but do not vote. Type three, vote but do not care. Type four, fought but pessimistic. Because why? Yeah, because of the uh, Ratu Atut dynasty. Which one are you, Pak Erman and Pak Mustafa? <laughs> <laughs> number one, okay, Pak Erman is number one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the data shows uh, the low voting participation in voting station whose eligible voters are in gated communities, most of them are below 50%. This one is in the Latinos, one of the biggest gated communities in BSD. In Bintaro, where Pak Herman lives, <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> it, they are below 40. Meanwhile, for comparison, I took a random sample of voting station in one of the poor communities in Tangsel. It's in Chipachang, one of the landfill area. Uh, their participation is quite high. It's usually at least 60%. Beside the political gaps, I also want to discuss about social and economic gaps. The existence of middle class, of course, will create gentrification. However, there are other uh, impacts that occur. One of the social uh, economic gaps that I want to highlight is related to social cohesion or the lack of it. Living in a new place, gated Gated community is convenience for the home buyer. When crime happens, which is not foreign in Tangsel, they will tighten up the security and gated complex be even become more gated. However, there is a price for this security and exclusivity. The middle class live in a very tight bubble that doesn't have room for them to socialize with uh, people from the kampung, aside from the transactional relationship. The workers in gated are usually from Kampung. They also restrict outsiders and street vendors should register and get approval before entering uh, the compound. Submitting IDs become more, if more and more common. As you can see in the picture, although they have portals outside the compound, the house will have the fence. So it's double security. Another example of socioeconomic gaps is private school versus public school. 
The middle class and gated communities rarely put their children in public schools. They do not even bother to survey. They usually already have stereotype or rumors from neighbors about certain schools, such as supper quality and bullying cases. Many are not worried that their children do not interact with more diverse children, but some walk parents choose public parks for their children to interact with children from kampung. Schools are too risky for them. You can tell from the pictures, right, which social class of parents from their motorbike. This is a public school, and this is private school. There are many reasons why they put their children in private schools. The main one is for the quality, of course. However, a parent complained that the expensive price they pay is actually for bare minimum. However, as the public school is subpar, she still uh, prefers private school. So, in conclusion, with all the facilities and infrastructure gap, middle class in gated communities may feel comfortable to live in their bubble, but they also think that they will not be affected by the poor quality of local government because their lives are accommodated by developers. However, private entities, nature is seeking profit and urban issues mostly cannot be resolved partially. So when a blueprint causes flood, housing complex streets is congested, and motorized delinquent gangs are rampant, who gonna voice the concern? Without the awareness of the citizens, especially middle class, who usually have knowledge more critical to monitor the local government vote rationally, this problem will only get worse and spread out. Yes. <laughs> and when your bubble bursts, will it be enough to only become a consumer? Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mbak Kori. So if you have a house in Jakarta, you are very rich, especially if you have a house in Jakarta Selatan, Anak Jaksel, <laughs> or Menteng, or BSD, as Mbak Kori mentioned. Right, um, now, uh, I'm now pleased to welcome our second speaker, uh, Ian Wilson. Ian Wilson is a senior lecturer in politics and security studies and a research fellow of the Indo-Pacific Research Center, Murdoch University. His research is focused on contemporary Indonesian politics and society with a particular emphasis on the political economy of urban social movements and the relationship of political violence and coercive capital to emerging forms of social power and he has authored two books, uh, The Politics of Protection Rackets in Post-New Order Indonesia, and also Politik Tenaga Dalam. Um, <laughs> that's very interesting. <laughs> Along with, of course, numerous articles and book chapters. Please join me in welcoming Ian Wilson. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for uh, welcoming me to, or inviting me to the update. My paper uh, starts from, let me see if I can get this right, started from a simple question. What does it mean to be secure in contemporary Jakarta? Well, of course, there's no simple answer to that because security isn't a fixed thing. It depends who you are. It depends where you are uh, in the city. Security is very much a contested idea, and that's particularly so in cities, any city uh, in the world today. Security and risk have become really central to how cities are planned, how they're built, and how they're governed. And the way that security politics or practices unfold will have distinct implications for different kinds of people. The gates uh, and portals that Corey uh, just showed before make some people feel safe, but to other people, they represent exclusion. They prevent entry. Uh, they create kinds of social orderings uh, of different sorts. This is, uh, I think, a particularly salient point in the context of Indonesia, uh, where security has really functioned often as a euphemism for political order uh, and a kind of a way of either disciplining or co-opting different kinds of social groups within society. What I going to do with this poor, I have done with this paper, I have written a draft by the way, uh, um, <laughs> with this paper is to look at 
the intersection between changes in the urban landscape in Jakarta and different kinds of security practices. Uh, and I've talked about these in two ways. One is vertical security and the other is horizontal security. Uh, before I get to that, I wanted to sort of set both a conceptual and a historical uh, context for the discussion. Uh, I've been engaging uh, with the, I think, a really useful idea from the economists Jayadev and Bals, who talked about what they called the rise of guard labour. And guard labour they describe as, uh, and I'm quoting from them here, those engaged in protection of private property, enforcement of claims on resources, and maintenance of distributional advantages in society. They call this, in classic Marxist terms, unproductive labour. And their observation, which was initially drawn from the United States, uh, was that there's been a strong correlation between the proportion of workforces engaged in guard labour and forms of socioeconomic uh, inequality. Uh, so they uh, estimated that in contemporary United States, for example, three out of ten uh, people in the workforce are engaged, broadly speaking, uh, in this guard labour. They also uh, argue uh, that patterns of urbanisation very much shape guard labour economies. Concentrations of capital, forms of spatial segregation, gated estates, super blocks and malls, for example, uh, all shape uh, the increases in uh, guard uh, labour. Uh, in this respect, Indonesia has sort of been a bit ahead of the curve. Uh, it's been actually since the 1990s that Indonesia had more private security, that's registered private security, than it had uh, police. Uh, and in fact, I, I tried to crunch the statistics. I haven't put them on a, a graph for you, but before I... Uh, did the presentation and Indonesia has one of the highest ratios of private security per capita uh, in the world. It has a relatively small police force, uh, roughly around half a million in total uh, for the country. But as of uh, July 2023, uh, and this is registered security companies, and I'll talk a little bit in a moment about uh, the context of registered security companies. There are around 1.7 million satpam, satuan pengamanan, another term for security uh, guard. So Indonesia has had and continues to have a large guard labour uh, force. Uh, and again, uh, and I do this in my paper, explore the links between patterns of guard labour and forms of socioeconomic inequality as they manifest in cities. They have concrete infrastructural uh, implications. So conceptually, I, I've been engaging with these ideas of guard uh, labour. Uh, and when I was talking to security company directors uh, in Jakarta, they explained it in very simple terms. Uh, one in particular uh, has mainly corporate clients uh, who have private security. It's very popular now. Firearm possession and training in firearms is actually also very common uh, amongst some of the more well-heeled of Jakarta. And he explained it in simple terms. He says, yeah, the more they have, the less safe they feel. It's great. <laughs> because, of course, they have a vested interest in this. So these perceptions of risk and threat uh, also shape the dimensions of security governance. Now, I wanted to just give a little bit of historical context because I think there are two broad trends that were established during the New Order that have changed but have formed a kind of, op a, kind of a logic of sorts that's flowed into the contemporary era. Now, if we look at transformations of Jakarta... Uh, from the 1970s onwards, uh, we saw this intersecting with the, I guess, the tendencies of the New Order regime, which were paranoid. Nothing scared the New Order more than the idea of the masses. Uh, and as Jakarta transformed uh, in two directions, uh, with the emergence of new housing estates, of new manufacturing, new factories, which required forms of security, you also saw the influx of migrants, the spread uh, and growth of informal settlements uh, and kampung. And these kampung to the New Order represented a kind of threat. They were a place where things could happen, where uprising could occur. Uh, and so there were patterns put in place or uh, uh, there was a policies put in place to try and manage uh, these things. And one in particular that was put in place in the 1980s is what's called siskamling, 
the environmental security system. Many people associate it with the guard posts that you'll see uh, in uh, local neighbourhoods, but it represented a broader rethinking of how to manage the security environment. You'd seen emergent private security companies in the 1980s in Jakarta. Many were formed out of the linkages between people who'd spent time in prison. People had strong networks uh, uh, in that kind of way, uh, and that scared the regime. Oh, gosh, that was quick. Um, it scared the regime, uh, who was worried about the formation of uh, a structural kind of threat, something akin to the mafia. So they introduced the syscumbling system. It uh, established SATPAM uh, as a kind of a proto-police force. They weren't the police, but they were also not fully not the police. They had a limited territorial scope linked to the protection of private property. Uh, and I call this linking into a kind of defensive security urbanism, which saw uh, the establishment of, of the SATPAM. Then in Kampung, you had a different approach. You had the system uh, of syscumbling, which involved local guards, the co-option of local gangsters, of local strongmen, and also self-surveillance into a kind of political policing of neighbourhoods, which the regime saw as places that could be spaces of unrest, spaces of turmoil. And how's the best way to maintain security? Will you incorporate the sources of insecurity as agents of security? And that's been one of the great sort of contradictions of figures like the Preman, which normatively refers to as a gang gangster or a thug, as figures who are both sources of insecurity but also security at the same time. So post New Order Jakarta uh, saw a fragmentation of these arrangements. Uh, it saw actively, residents actively seeking security on their own terms, forms of vigilantism, forms of social organisations that concern themselves with security, often in religious or moral uh, or cultural terms. There was a contestation of what security meant. Space was contested in territory. If we understand territory as trying to establish authority within a particular area, was also contested between uh, different groups. And it was quite a violent era. The early 2000s, Jakarta saw frequent conflicts between different groups. It saw struggles over local economies. The politics of parking, for example, uh, saw significant, often violent conflicts between different groups in central uh, uh, Jakarta. An attempt to try... Oh, I'm sorry, that was my mistake. No, right. Oh, you, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're messing with me. All right, I'll slow down then. <laughs> I was no, ploughing through it at high speed. Um, okay, let me go back to my other slide then. <laughs> so you saw these new polls emerge about contesting different spatial and moral orders in the city. Forms of identity, forms of community became the basis for articulating logics of security within the city. At the same time, processes of urban transformation continued. Jakarta is, of course, the city of malls. It has more shopping malls. Some may be correct me if I'm wrong. has more shopping malls than almost any other city in the world. You saw the expansion of gated estates that were formed around ideas of forms of social homogeneity. Social homogeneity can only be produced through significant security interventions. The screening of people, who can come and go, and how people experience a sense of exclusion from other elements uh, of uh, the city. So what we saw was an attempt uh, to establish a new framework for organising a broad and often kind of uh, cacophony of different security actors in the city. Uh, in formal legislative terms, we thought the 2002 police law, which outlined uh, outside of the police a number of non-state security actors who were recognised by the police. Uh, and these were broadly referred to as PAM Swarkasa, which is a sort of a voluntary security agent uh, uh, of some sort. And there were three different types. There were registered security guards. There was what was referred to as local wisdom or customary groups. The most commonly cited example of which is Pachalang in Bali, who are involved in the security over 
traditional um, practices, cultural and religious practices, and then uh, voluntary community groups concerned with security, a, a suitably ambiguous term that encompasses an entire gambit of paramilitary organisations, militia groups, religious groups such as the Defenders of Islam Front, uh, as well as local organisations that verge from genuine com community organisations through to predatory uh, and criminal uh, organisations as well. What it did, importantly, is it established the police as the gatekeepers. So with the separation of the military and the police, the police were now empowered to determine who was and wasn't registered as a security actor. Uh, so it saw the emergence of the private security industry. During the new order, there were very strict controls on private security actors. The police uh, and the military uh, had their own kind of uh, rackets or businesses at hand, but other actors were strictly controlled. This sort of constituted almost a, a, a liberalisation of private security. Uh, security companies could register with the police. Uh, they had to undergo training from the police. So SUPPUM had to be registered with the police and have one, there were three different levels of training. Uh, and so it led to a form of professionalisation uh, of the security uh, market. And this happened uh, very quickly. Within the space of a couple of years, there were hundreds and then later thousands of registered security companies uh, in uh, Jakarta. Uh, and it also saw a huge influx of international players. Uh, security is such a massive commodity in a place like Jakarta. Many international companies, G4S from the Securicore group, for example, uh, one of the longest players in Indonesia is SECOM. It's uh, one of the largest Japanese private security providers. All saw the opportunities of the Jakarta market uh, and a friendly market uh, to international players. So we also saw uh, interesting kind of mergers where big capital uh, intensive private security companies would move in to Jakarta. They would buy up smaller companies that often struggled uh, with the contract and paying of staff uh, element, uh, and this saw the consolidation of some international players as well. So this market competition, in some cases, had what you could broadly call, uh, in uh, the terms of Norbert Elias, a civilising effect, insofar as the more players that they were, uh, there was a surprising absence of conflict and violence. The early 2000s was a kind of ordering uh, period of different groups contesting authority and territory. Uh, but by the mid to late 2010, uh, the industry was relatively uh, well consolidated and you saw the establishment of niche specialisations, executive bodyguards, uh, intelligence gathering units, for example. Uh, there's quite extraordinary uh, resources deployed by some, or services, I should say, offered by some private security companies, particularly to the corporate sector, uh, to infiltrate local societies, to detect possible uh, uh, dissent to building a new factory or a new land development. So these are all uh, commodities uh, that are offered uh, to the marketplace. Companies themselves, uh, and they're still the biggest clients of private security, will often uh, employ a number of different kinds of security providers. That will be uh, one example is uh, Agum Podomoro, it's one of the biggest land developers in Jakarta, and they have in-house security who are trained via the police uh, SATPAM system uh, who they employ, uh, but they also contract social organisations uh, such as a, a Bantan uh, organisation and a uh, militia called the Laskar Meraputi, uh, and this is really part of how they negotiate the different kinds of security challenges they may face. So ORMAS, to put it bluntly, will be used in contestation, land, contestation over land, occupying land, intimidating local people. Uh, and there's a, a third arm element to it. Uh, companies uh, are sensitive to public opinion. Where there's blowback, they can distance themselves from it. But they'll also have their own in-house security guards. And often, uh, as you can see on the slide at the top, uh, often have uh, relationships with uh, foreign providers. The top slide, the text, I apologise, isn't particularly clear, is from a local uh, security organisation called SPD. Uh, they have a contractual arrangement with a group called Asset, who are a US-based private military contractor. 
uh, who subcontract them with corporate clients in Jakarta. And this is actually quite a common kind of arrangement, uh, seeing international players come in and form these kinds of relationships. Another element that I've explore in my paper is looking at this idea of guard labour and satpam as precarious labour. Uh, satpams are routinely underpaid. Uh, they suffer ex serious poor conditions. And over the past decade or so, there's been increasing cases of satpams going on strike. Uh, for example, at housing estates when they haven't been paid for months uh, at a time. There's been attempts uh, to unionise uh, and this was an interesting case where there were satpam organisations that announced their intention to form a serikat satpam, a serikat, uh, or a, 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 a labour union for satpam uh, workers. And this drew to the surface again this kind of ambiguous role of private security, where the police in particular strongly objected, arguing, well, satpam are kind of police. So you can't have the police unionising because it fundamentally compromises what they do. You can't have Satpam joining protests. They should be protecting the assets uh, of their employers. So this goes back to this kind of uh, ambiguous relationship with Satpam as being neither apparat, not formally a part of the security apparatus, but they're not fully workers at the same time insofar as they've been denied the opportunity uh, to uh, unionise. How am I going for time? Oh, one minute now, okay. So, and I'll try and move through this quite quickly, and I, I look forward to hopefully some, some, some questions from you. It's looking at these two forms of the city in Jakarta and how it relates to different kinds of trends in security. One is what I referred to as verticality, uh, and this has seen the rise of digital surveillance. Uh, apartment buildings, super blocks, uh, gated estates often have single portal modes of exclusion and entry, uh, and this has seen uh, an emergent market away from traditional forms of guard labour, satpam, guys milling around, that kind of security, to the increasing use of high-tech uh, security. Uh, increasingly, and this is where international players have cornered the market, uh, you see international security companies uh, uh, introducing uh, facial recognition uh, and AI alongside uh, CCTV uh, and uh, other forms of technological security in, into integrated systems approaches to security. So this integrated systems, in, in brief, because I have like, what, a minute to go, uh, is a kind of a corporate idea of risk. So security entails not just managing risks of crime and who comes and goes from buildings, uh, but also offering uh, management and surveillance of staff. So SECOM offer uh, AI uh, detection systems which uh, can look for people lurking around the building, but will also monitor when uh, workers come and go, when they're at their workstations, and more integrated uh, approaches. Uh, and this has been a kind of uh, a great place for foreign players because it's been highly unregulated. Uh, and so there's been a, a great investment uh, in this. Again, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll move along to my next is the other world is what I call the horizontal security, and this is in the mixed neighbourhoods and kampung uh, of Jakarta. Time? We're getting to time? Yeah, okay, uh, I'll wrap it up really quickly. Uh, and this uh, is a different world entirely, uh, where security actors are intertwined with social relations of the neighbourhood in, in very complex ways, not just about screening, but preman, uh, and I think uh, preman often get characterised simply as, as gangsters, but are often involved in very complex sets of relationships uh, and as mediators between uh, urban neighbourhoods with other forms of authority and other kinds of, of interest. And social organisations, I have an example of the FBR there, the Forum Batawi and Puk, are a great example of agents of both security and insecurity. Uh, they've been predatory, but they've also been highly, often in some cases, very representative uh, of local uh, communities. Okay, and then some conclusions uh, to wrap up. And I make some, I guess, speculative conclusions uh, in my paper about some of the trends that we've seen over the past decade in Jakarta. One, I think the expansion of smart city and security surveillance technology is really a kind of a new frontier 
in Jakarta's security governance. We already have the integration of AI and facial recognition technology in some public transportation hubs, uh, and the private sector has really had an unregulated freedom in exploring this. This has had some other uh, 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 implications such as challenging guard labour's historical role of absorbing uh, so-called excess labour, which has had a political function in the Indonesian uh, context, uh, and also uh, th the forms of greater social uh, spatial segregation, uh, segregation of upper middle classes, in gated estates, etc., and how the securitisation of these spaces is feeding into what I argue is forms of anti-democracy, uh, where hyper-securitised spaces, which regulates social hem uh, homogeneity, who can come and go, and basically creates spaces where nothing happens, also creates an ambivalence towards democracy itself. It's something that's been documented in other parts of the world. And, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for the fabulous presentation, uh, Ian. And I'm really sh sorry, I, yeah, I rushed you before. <laughs> right. Um, I'm now pleased to welcome our last speaker for this session, Associate Professor Rita Padawangi. Rita Padawangi is an Associate Professor at the College of Interdisciplinary Experience Experiential learning, learning, Singapore University of Social Sciences. Um, her work focuses on social movements and participatory urban development, uh, employing collaborative approaches in research, teaching, and also community engagement. Rita also coordinates the Southeast Asia Neighborhoods Network, funded by the Henry Luce Foundation. Um, which promotes urban research and education. Her most recent publication is Urban Development in Southeast Asia. Please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Rita Padawangi. Okay. I was told that the organizers are very strict with time, so I also want to keep myself at time here. Uh, I know I have a lot of slides, but these are going to be very, very colorful. So, um, <laughs> All right, so my task here is to follow up uh, Corey's and Ian's pre uh, fabulous presentations with uh, by talking about public space. Now, uh, public spaces in the city are from the civil society perspectives. Now, I want to start with this question. When you hear the term public space, uh, what kind of image come to mind? Like, would, this, would it be these kinds of spaces? I know, I know what it is. Okay, this is somewhere in Jakarta. I'll come back to this. You'll see this again later. Um, or something like this, another colorful photo. Um, and everybody will say, like, I know what it is. So. All right, so well, public space can be a place where there are crowds to conduct activities together or a combination of different groups conducting different activities, but somehow they can share the space. Now, public space remains an important topic that continues to generate critical discussions in any literature about urban planning, urban life, and governance. Readings about cities have identified them as places where strangers can meet, discuss and shape ideas, conduct social activities and actions, all of which require public spaces that are accessible to relatively all citizens. The idea that public spaces are a must-have in any city signifies its importance in city life. Public spaces are an integral part of urban life, be it in the form of the built environment, which is the physical spaces, as well as the social spaces in which these discussions can take place. Without public spaces, a city wouldn't be a city. Public spaces are important ingredients that make cities more than an agglomeration of inhabitants and dwellings. Now, um, public space and the city, right? Um, so what can, what can they be? So um, literature say that public spaces can be anything from streets, parks, pavements, beaches, and city squares until the digital spaces of the media, internet, and social media. So basically a lot of spaces. So uh, in those kinds of spaces, we can see that public spaces usually entails one is the built environment or the physicality of the space, the infrastructures, or the social space. Now when it comes to the physical space, what would or should a public space look like? Um, and uh, now we come to the 
a difficult question, which is about the public. What is actually the public here? In understanding public space, is, 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 is uh, imperative to uh, understand what public is. So uh, public, uh, in public spaces, uh, entails the concern about the dimensions as well as the extent of its publicness. And the important questions that come up usually who actually owns public spaces, and how should a public space be governed. And oftentimes, it is sort of like um, being compared to private spaces. And I'm going to ask the same questions again at the end, right? So public versus private. Uh, and we come to the question of accessibility. So public access versus private access. We talked about gates before. We talked about security before. So it encompasses all these aspects. So again, when we ask the same question, who owns a public space? Can a private owner have a public space, which, is, which comes to the concept of the privately owned public spaces? Uh, this can take place in, I don't know, certain kinds of shopping malls, probably. Uh, but then who regulates this, those public spaces? And then does ownership matter? So all these types of public spaces, can they also be privately owned? So ownership of space will de determine accessibility as well as regulations over space. That is the governance of the space. So if we ask the same question again, who is the public? When we say public space, it's very easy to say public space. But who is the public? Uh, is the public uh, equal to government? Because when we say the public sector, oftentimes easily we associate it with government. But is it really that the public space, public mean uh, government? So if it is, if it has something to do with government, then there is a question of representation. Who represents the public? And we ask the same question again. How should a public space be governed then? All right. So let's go to Indonesia. So how about governing public spaces in cities of Indonesia? We often hear again and again that Indonesia has uh, had the experiment of decentralization, and we see the rise of the local leaders to the national stage. So uh, I have a quote here from the current president. He mentioned, uh, without infrastructure, this country can never be competitive. Right? So uh, he himself rose from being a mayor of Solo and then the governor of Jakarta. And uh, his campaigns has always been associated with his ability to manage cities. So there is this emphasis on urban managerial leadership, which focuses on architecturally beautiful and neat landscapes. Some of you might have uh, re uh, recognized this space here. Uh, this is the Taman Wadu Pluit, one of the projects that became uh, the poster child of his campaign uh, uh, of his first presidency in 2014. And so urban managerial leadership also relates with infrastructure development. So there is this kind of focus on the managerial qualities in electing a government leader, and architecture and infrastructure becomes a political capital. But then, in the managerial city then, the relationship between state actors and civil society can be somewhat uh, mirrors what Corey has presented before, the relationship between corporate producers and consumers of space. Uh, so we, uh, we often see the celebrated mayors, such as Burisma, will have this poster uh, park. This is Taman Bungkul in Surabaya. Or maybe some of you will recognize this park over here. Can any of you recognize here? Ridwan Kamil in Bandung, and this is Taman Film, right? So public space improvements become political capital for many city leaders to get recognized. And I see uh, Mayor Bima actually nodded there. So. Um, so, so then, if that is the case, what are the measures of a good public space then that reflects this managerial quality? So there can be projects with image of city improvement, so, uh, and public spaces are very visible, very exposed. But then we also encounter a challenge here. Some say, and many people say, that Indonesia is a very diverse community. Uh, and if we have diverse communities in the city, um, and we have fragmented societies, like Ian was mentioning, what then, and I ask the same question again, what are the measures of a good public space then in this diverse community? Okay, from those serious questions, let's look at more colorful 
images that I'm going to show you uh, from different spaces in Indonesia. Uh, the reason why I chose this space is, is very uh, out of convenience. I happen to have some research projects in some of these areas. But later on, you'll see, and I try to, um, uh, I try to um, describe them very briefly because we only have 20 minutes total, and I have four sites to tell a story about. So let's go back to this place again. Um, and this place is from Jakarta. and. Uh, talking about public spaces with um, good physical image, right? Uh, this one uh, may be more uh, sort of like fitting to that description. So it may be more generally appealing in spaces that are designed by professional architects, such as this park here, which is the Bat Eko Park in Jakarta, that has been very popular since its development or redevelopment. So this has just reopened in 2022. But then, if we, if we see public spaces, it can also be spaces like these. So when spaces are less, quote unquote, polished by professional architects, suddenly it becomes a gray area, but it doesn't really negate that it is still a public space. So in the same city, there can be public spaces like these too. This particular public space situated under the highway in North Jakarta is collectively managed by a community. We can see that the space is accessible, but those who are not involved in managing it may not feel encouraged to access. So uh, this is probably my densest slide out of all. Um, so in terms of governing public spaces, we come to the question of inclusion and exclusion. Public spaces as shared spaces that are accessible to everyone in the community is presumably for collective goods. But Indonesia's social, political, and economic, uh, economic situation are rife with inequalities. So we ask the question here then, uh, public space by whom and for whom? So publicness in public spaces would be more complex when there are different communities with different interests using the same space. The collision of interests occur when they are using the same limited space. The larger, the denser a city, the more likely collisions will take place. So uh, here we have an example of uh, the collision between pedestrian and street vendors. This is from 2019. The Supreme Court ruled against a bylaw in Jakarta on street vending. The plaintiffs were individuals from the Indonesian Solidarity Party, known as the PSE, that argued, uh, A, street vendors are disturbances to the people's right to the sidewalk, especially the pedestrians and B, street vendors profit commercially from their operations on the public spaces at the expense of the pedestrians and other people's access. This Supreme Court ruling begs the question then of who the public is in the case of sidewalks in Jakarta and more generally, what public space is. More generally, again, the ban on certain uses of public spaces raises the question of who has the authority to decide and what is the basis of that decision. So uh, when the city is fragmented along social inequalities and identities, will the perceived collective good of one community also be a collective good of another? Or will it condemn other communities to being excluded from public space? And then we ask the same question again. Which society are we talking about here? Public space by whom and for whom? So another example of colliding interest in public spaces in Jakarta is the case of riverbank spaces with public good or collective good being put forth as the basis of concrete embankment project against flooding along the Chiliwung. Two kampongs, uh, Kampong Pulo was evicted in August 2015, and Bukit Duri across the river were flattened in September 2016. And this photo was taken five days after Bukit Duri was flattened. So passing by that place now will seem like a public space, but underneath the space was the story of forced evictions of hundreds of households and local communities. So in terms of governing public spaces, with the example of flood alleviation projects in Jakarta, who actually decides on Jalan Inspeksi as the project for flood alleviation? Who decides on the approaches of concrete embankment? And who gets affected from these decisions? Who benefits and who gets sacrificed? Will these public spaces actually sacrifice people and children like Bintang, who said Bintang's house is gone, demolished, the beko, and beko is actually the word from backhoe, 
which is related to development, but in Jakarta, beko means eviction. So, uh, and then we come back to the increasing demand for a managerial city leadership. The beautification projects that is associated with public spaces might actually uh, be marginalizing adversely affected groups through residential and or economic displacements. So we come back again to this photo here, which I'm sure many of you would recognize that this is from Taman Kalijodo, which also uh, include a forced eviction of the Kalijodo community. So beautiful public spaces according to whom? And I'm just quoting a paper here from Saigon that beautification has uh, uh, often been associated as an element of control. And beautiful public spaces, according to who, overlooks diversity of needs and aspirations. If we have a city as diverse as Jakarta, this is a map from uh, Abidin's uh, chapter in uh, as uh, 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 these maps, the kampongs in Jakarta, as well as a map of the Gini ratio in the metropolitan area of Jakarta by Pak Deden Rukmana. So uh, the next story will come from another city in Surabaya. So after those critical questions, right? So when we say we make collective decisions on governing public spaces, how can it be look like, right? So uh, here we go to the city of Surabaya, but I'm not going to tell a story about Burisma, OK? Uh, whether or not Burisma was a mayor, this public space will still be around. So there, see, this, uh, we are going to Kampung Panele in Surabaya. So these are the examples of governing public spaces in city neighborhoods. So the example here, I show you that um, they have the rule to ban motorized vehicles in the alleyways, much like compared to the banning of street vendors on the sidewalks, right? But the difference here, the banning of the motorized vehicles was a decision taken among the residents. Motorcycles have to turn off their engines and push the vehicle as they enter the kampong all the way into their own homes, and this applies to delivery riders as well. Such rule is for the purpose of noise reduction, which was perceived as a collective good in the kampong, as the alleyways were narrow and noises from motor vehicles would have been very close to their doors and windows. The alleyways can also change uses according to the festive seasons. Besides festivities such as weddings and Independence Day celebrations, the alleyways of Kampung Panele completely transformed during the days building up to Idul Adha, being filled with sheep and cows as kurban animals. The alleyways are also spaces for children to play, from hide and seek to alleyway football. So Surabaya is more than just Buddhism. Okay. Um, <laughs> and there are also public spaces like this. Uh, this is also from Surabaya. All right. Uh, this is from Kampung Strangkali in Surabaya. Uh, the one on the left uh, and the one on the right side. Uh, we're going back to Jakarta. So if Surabaya can do that, can Jakarta do that too? Yes. Uh, the image on the right in Surabaya, uh, in Jakarta, was from Jakarta's Kampung Hijau Bursary in Cempaka Putih, in which the residents themselves uh, collectively uh, developed the space as a green uh, alleyway. You should visit if you have a chance. All right. So uh, from Jakarta, let's go to one of the fake kabupatens in Pak Arman's presentation. This is from the fake kabupaten Gianyar in Ubud. Um, the collective governance of space can also be observed here. This is one of the community halls in one of the banjars in Ubud. And during my observation of community activities in an urbanizing village in Ubud, uh, the community hall was an example of a public space that was open to the residents with a condition that those who come to the space was to wear traditional Balinese outfit. So these public spaces can be used together collectively and they can put regulations also be made collectively. And then um, this is the furthest uh, um, case study from, uh, from the three. Um, a separate observation of neighborhood scale public spaces was in Kampung Yoboy in urbanizing Santani in Papua. It provided me an opportunity to experience their colorful walkway, which involved the residents in painting the wooden planks to, to improve the space appearance. The Kampung also has a publicly accessible community library, a rumah baca, a reading house, as a note of communal activities. All these spaces are governed on the neighborhood level and are relatively autonomous from the top-down intervention from a higher level of government. 
But uh, collective governance of space, does it really just apply to these other cities, not just Jakarta? Well, we saw the example from Champaka Putih. This is another example that we saw in Elisa's presentation yesterday. And I, I couldn't resist, you know. I went, okay, I present after, after Ian, I have a photo of him in Kampung Susun. So here you go, this is Kampung Susun Aquarium. So the city need not be small to feature collective governance. It can be a big city with some autonomy of neighborhoods and also this can be seen in the Kampung Bukit Duri in Jakarta during their Pasar Rakyat in which they convert the space into this fest uh, festival. So upon exploring the possibilities of collective governance, how democratic can public space governance be? When there's a range of diversity, inequality, towards segregation and eventually fragmentation, how can colliding publics govern public spaces democratically? those that are accessible to all, when the city is a collection of segregated communities, when political power and economic inequality obstruct equal voices in governing public spaces, and when collective good of one community can collide with another's. And speaking of uh, collision, it can even get greater when we see uh, democratic public spaces that necessitates the diverse uses as diverse as this, including challenging those in power. And this is a photo from Reformasi di Korupsi. So in governing public spaces in uh, the city, uh, the manifestation of democracy in public spaces are actually the result of reformasi. Before reformasi, public protest may bring trouble to the protesters, like what was experienced by Suara Ibu Paduli in this photo. So community and civil society associations really need autonomous spaces to effectively gather, debate, vote on, and to participate in issues concerning the local and broader urban community. So again, going back to the question, how should a public space be governed? And I'm just going to highlight the last one here. How does public space beautification regime fit with democratic governance? And if we see space, uh, spaces like this, after Suharto's uh, resignation, protests actually took place in Jakarta almost every day. And protests may, uh, uh, may bring messiness and contradiction with the beautification regime. Um, and the public spaces as common resources can be places for marginalized communities to capitalize on the public spaces visibility and exposure. And this includes the urban poor, victims and survivors of human rights violation and concerns from the countryside. And I'm just gonna flip through here, okay? If there is a concern from the uh, evictions in Pulau Rempang, for example, where would they go to bring their concerns? They bring their concerns not just in Pulau Rempang, but they bring their concerns to Bepe Batam, which is on another island, and they can bring also, uh, in this case, uh, their concern to Jakarta. This is a concern from the Kendeng Mountain uh, farmers uh, that bring their concerns to the presidential palace in Jakarta. All right, so let's learn from smaller scale public spaces uh, in Jakarta, uh, in, in Indonesia, as common resources. And I'm just gonna quote here, sorry, I, I, run, out of, uh, I run out of time, but let me just, uh, just read through this because I think this is uh, one of the main points is that this new mode of governance that we learn from public spaces is not an instantly produced societal structure, but rather it's an evolving process that allows for trial and error. However, adequate support from the government can ensure continued provision of public goods and enhance commitments to social equity and environmental sustainability. Thank you very much. I noticed Nita also turn, uh, Rita also turned on uh, her timer, which is good. <laughs> so you have, yeah, so you have your own time management, that is good. Okay, now, um, what remarkable presentations. Uh, thank you so much, all panelists. Um, I'm sure many of you have lots of questions. Uh, now let's take uh, four questions. Um, okay, uh, Ross, and then from that side, Nava. And uh, in the in the middle, <laughs> and um, yeah, and then Sana. Uh, let's start from uh, Russ. Okay. 
Oh, sorry, Pak Hal. Oh, yeah, oh uh, sorry, hi. sorry, uh, Pak Hal. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's I think almost lunch just, time, Pak. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Trimakasi, Pa-ho. I've just had a name change. I'm yeah. Hal Hill. Uh, yeah, next, <laughs> up, next to Pak Ross. <laughs> thank, yeah. thank you. So I've got a, a question uh, or comment which is applying to several sessions, but it's illustrated with this session, I think, as well. And that is how Indonesia can learn from successes elsewhere in the neighbourhood. And I think a good illustration of that, uh, Corey, if I could direct it to you. Uh, one of the best examples in the world of public housing of, of, of uh, Peruma and Rakyat is next door in Singapore. The Housing Development Board, uh, I think, still has 80% of Singapore's population. And, uh, you know, you can say lots of things about Singapore, but that's clearly, I think, a success story widely acknowledged. Question is, why can't Indonesia, or should Indonesia learn from it, and if so, how? And just in case it's thought that it's because Singapore's rich and all that, it's different, when the HDB, the Housing Development Board, started in Singapore, Singapore's per capita income was probably about the same as Indonesia's now. So, and by the way, the same question applies to every other session, I think, and a good example was public transport yesterday. Congestion pricing is, is an obvious solution to uh, combine with, you know, really efficient mass public transport, and that's illustrated in Singapore, by the way, and elsewhere in the region. So the question is, I guess, in all sessions, learning from successes elsewhere. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nava? Uh, thank you. My question is for Ian. So with the rise of all these private security companies, often foreign ones, and the digital surveillance, how does that affect the relationship with traditional ORMAS like Pemuda Pancasila and Laskar Mera Puti? So are you seeing an emergent pattern of relationship? Do the Pemuda Pancasila stick to the competitive advantage which, like as political canvasser, for example? How do you see it? Thanks. Okay, Bu Afi. In the middle? Terima kasih. Um, saya Afi dari Ciliwung. Um, it's, a, it's a short question. It's, it's about the status of the owner and uh, w- how the ownerships of the land. Like most of the uh, presentations, I see it's a f- foreign uh, face, like myself in Jakarta. So um, w- what happened to them and whether there is a good example of the owners of the land that you know, reclaim the landscape of the uh, new urban. Thank you. Anna? Uh, my question is... Thanks. So my question is for um, Ian and for Corey. Um, both of you are describing a scenario in which a particular class of residents are increasingly opting out of being recipients of public service. Um, security, so they're securing themselves by employing private guards and they're building themselves facilities. What do you think that trend will do to impact the delivery of public service to the rest of the population? Do you think it will make elected officials more likely to provide services and orient themselves to providing services for the poor who are not eligible for these kinds of private arrangements? Or do you think it will just make them less likely to deliver overall? We'll start, Mbak Kori. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, first, for, for uh, Pak Ho, um, why Indonesia cannot learn from the successful stories of other places? That's a big question. <laughs> they learn a lot. They do, you know, comparative study and everything. But they all, the government some, somehow always have reasons and excuses why. Uh, in terms of Singapore and HDB, they always say that Singapore has a very advantages in land ownership, uh, while in Jakarta the land is scarce, so it's so hard to build and uh, it, and it's so hard to 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 implement the same system as HDB. Uh, that's the main reasons. Uh, and then uh, they also, uh, you know, because of uh, we, uh, for 
especially for middle class, the government tend to give it away to the uh, to the private and to the market. Okay. Uh, can I answer all? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I uh, get it right about the ownership of the land in um, in housing complexes. Most of them owned by the uh, by the individuals. So if you buy a, a unit of house, you get your unit. But uh, for but the developers still manage uh, outside your home. <laughs> so for example, the roads, the street lamps, the trees, and everything. And um, usually, uh, they also take care, of, um, you know, monopolize the water and then also the electricity. As I told you before, they uh, the local government sell it in box to the developers, and then they d disperse it to the uh, the houses. And for Sana um, in South Tangerang, unfortunately, <laughs> actually uh, we discuss this a lot. Actually, the developers already take a big chance of uh, you know uh, managing the city, right? So it's easier. Uh, supposed to be easier for the local government, but so far they there's not much uh, evidence <laughs> going on, uh, and we're still asking why. Actually, like yeah, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but Ian, yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, now, but just to your to your question, um, it really depends on the context. One thing that private security company directors. Um, told me a lot was the biggest problem they face in the field was dealing with ormas. <laughs> uh, and that was summarised by two conflicting logics. One was that private security companies are delivering a service to a client uh, and ormas are based in uh, ideas of territorial entitlement. That's how I was e explained to me and I, I think it captures that very well. So in some cases security companies will be hired by you know, a, a factory, for example, uh, and will have um, conflict with Oromas that feel that that's their turf. Mm. And so they feel entitled to getting something, uh, but without necessarily offering something. So there is tension points. Um, many, Pamuda Panchasila is probably the good example because they're deeply entrepreneurial. Uh, and <laughs> so um, you'll find in Pamuda Panchasila, um, that they will, if there's an opportunity to do something, they'll do it. So they have security companies linked to them and highly professional ones. In fact, some of the most highly trained security providers, particularly for executive uh, security, are with, from people within Pumuta Panchasila, including people who've trained in Israel, the United States, mm -hmm. in yeah. skills that they sell to executive uh, clients. Um, other groups might, might struggle with that. Uh, but there is, in the field, yeah, there is a tension between those, those traditional groups and then private security. Um, Sana, so on your uh, question, uh, there's probably a couple of ways of looking at it. I think in some respects that sort of securitisation of space and that retreat from the public intersects with a kind of political passivity. So I wonder whether it has political impacts insofar as these communities or spaces already feel served, where if you don't have the services, and we've seen great examples with Kampung Aquarium and other, people are politically active, and so they will engage in the political process to try and deliver things. So I, I guess maybe that's, that might be the, lo the kind of uh, logic that's at, at, at play, or dynamic, thanks. Let me just very quickly to respond on why uh, Indonesia cannot um, replicate from the neighbours uh, being uh, Having lived in Singapore for quite some time, I also often get these questions. Uh, but I would also answer to going back to uh, Pa Abidin's presentation yesterday about the critical juncture. I think we already passed it um, <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, maybe it started around the same kind of economic uh, conditions uh, when when the countries first get independence. But then besides the, the question of scale of land uh, that was uh, already Corey explained before, uh, Indonesia also also has a, a more a vast diversity and also uh, unequal geographies. So we are not just looking at Jakarta, but if we go to uh, islands that are 
further away from Java, we can see that uh, the, the gradation, uh, the spectrum is actually very wide. So it's, it's, a, it's very difficult to have like one size fits all program in terms of housing for the whole of Indonesia. Indonesia tried to have it, and I would say that it doesn't really get very far. Um, and, and, and furthermore, in Singapore, we also need to remember now, yes, it does, uh, the HDB, the Housing and Development Board in Singapore does house 85% of Singaporeans and residents, which means that the HDB is the largest developer of the country. So, uh, the largest developer. Now, if we ask the same question to Indonesia, uh, is Perumnas the largest developer in Indonesia? And I think you know many of us will smile. Uh, and I guess this also the, uh, signifies a difference in terms of the political economy of housing uh, in Indonesia. Okay, uh, great. Uh, so I would like to remind you again, please ask a short and concise uh, question, preferably one person, one question. And I would like to um, ask Haura, uh, we have also questions from our Zoom audience. Haura? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so we have, is it all right to have two questions? Two, yeah, yeah, two questions. So the first question is from Tan Tonia Sinaga, IPB University, Bogor. Um, um, I have always thought that steel barricades across shops, windows, doors, and cars in Manila, Philippines are due to high level of disinformal security apparatus. It's directed to Ian. Um, based on your presentations, no, um, she thinks that uh, perhaps it's because they do not have as much as these security groups in Jakarta. Um, therefore, uh, they maintain their own security. Yet both the regimes in Manila and Jakarta embrace anti-democratic cultures before. What makes Jakarta different to Manila? Um, and second question from Arya Duta from Yogyakarta to Bakori. How do Tangselians struggle to participate <laughs> politically? And how do they participate? Is it through the consumerism in coffee shops or malls? That's okay. the question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and we can take uh, two more questions. Okay, uh, one in the middle and then um, uh, one there. And um, yeah, we might open another uh, Q and A uh, session after this. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, in the middle. Hi, I'm Clara from ANU. My question is directed to uh, Mbak Rita. Uh, what does it take um, to prevent that the mid uh, the middle class sort of capture the kind of public issues shared across classes and groups like we know like flood mitigations and then the solution is um, uh, evictions and relocations although flooding is sort of like an issue for everyone right uh, yesterday we see uh, Tialisa presentation in Kampung and it takes a lot of effort for one two three Kampungs right but there are hundreds of Kampung there are millions of Jakartans and uh, urban cities in Indonesia, what does it take to create a sense of uh, a political uh, conscience across classes and groups? Thank you. Yeah. And one more? Test, test. Hi. Um, thank you very much. My name is Andy. I'm representative of uh, Australia Awards G20 Awards, um, G20 Scholars. Sorry. I would like to direct my question to Ibu Rita Padang as well. I find the, uh, the presentation is um, um, pretty much interesting for me as well. So I have a, a two-prong of question, which I think are quite relevant with, with each other. So the first one is like you mentioned about the public society ownership could affect how the collective good could be. Um, represented or even amplified. So in your research, I would like to understand how the ownership of the public or even the privately owned um, public space uh, affect the collective good. And the second prong is like, uh, is you, you're mentioning as well about the beautification of public park, which identified uh, element of control with that uh, public spaces. In that sense, I would like to understand how does this affect collective good for society in general. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So should we start with uh, Purita? I just finished jotting down the questions. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> but, okay uh, uh, it's all right. So mm. I guess I'll, I'll answer the first one first. How do we, uh, how do we cultivate cross-class political conscience across group? Um, I guess there, there are different possibilities. Um, and um, I guess when, 
a good example of this is when reformasi happened, right? How, how did it happen? And there was like one particular crisis that actually drove them all and suddenly everybody uh, got into a lower economic class because of the economic crisis and that opens up a window. But that only happened when there was already uh, a building of uh, movements that from below. Uh, reformasi did not just happen because of the crisis, but for years of mobilization, they suddenly find some political opportunity that uh, that comes out. So one thing uh, that I would say about the cross-class political consciousness in sort of like uh, cultivating the sense of political publicness in the city, it is, uh, it is always a, a, a long and messy process, uh, like what is the, what, what I quoted at the end. Uh, that was from the public intellectual forum that we had in 2020. Some of us here was also in that forum. I'm, I'm looking at you, Pa Abidin. We were in that <laughs> forum as well. Uh, but, um, and uh, one, one thing, uh, one thing that for sure, um, Indonesia has gone through years of, um, of, of, uh, of experience of not actually um, asking about these uh, these questions. We have 32 years of of the new order era in which uh, we are kind of um, uh, separate. Uh, we, are, we are segregated from 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 the different uh, different groups' uh, uh, concerns. We uh, at that time we didn't even know what was going on in the other parts of Indonesia, for example. So it is it is always a work in progress, and there is no um, there is no uh, there is no quick solution to this, given that the situation has built up for decades. Uh, I would say, though, that uh, the current regime of beautification doesn't really help in that, because uh, that also kind of obscures the the different kinds and the the the, uh, the diversity of the voices of different kinds of spaces that, that are needed in our diverse society. Um, so it's not just in terms of education, I would say, uh, but also in terms of uh, just continuing the kinds of discussions that are going on, utilizing the existing and still uh, uh, still working public spaces that embraces all, uh, including the public space that might happen not in physical spaces. Like last night, for example, there was a public space that happened on Twitter, now X, talking about how the media uh, would uh, react to the uh, uh, to the eviction of Pulau Rempang, for example. And that's, that's the kinds of discussions that needs to continue to cultivate until uh, uh, a kind of political opportunity uh, also uh, appears again. Okay, uh, thank you, Rita. So, um, pa Ian, you want to uh, add something? Yeah. Um, not, not no? Oh, no? Okay, uh, then but Corey? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's about how, how do uh, Tangsalian participate politically, right? Um, yeah, of course, in cafes. <laughs> 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 there are two types of uh, Tangsalians, actually. The one who do not care about politics at all, so they're already busy with their lives and the school of the kids and everything. And the other one is SJW. There are a lot of social <laughs> justice warriors who live in South Tangerang. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they talk a lot about the situation in the in the city, but it goes nowhere, unfortunately, <laughs> so far. So we hope someday. But some other groups actually try to make public initiatives, but usually for you know, like for example, making the neighborhood more green, more that kind of initiative in, instead of uh, politically. Okay, so, um, right, uh, we still have uh, one quick, oh, okay, one minute left, oh, one minute left, I thought one more question, okay, <laughs> right, um, okay, uh, I'm just, uh, yeah, we are conscious of the time, uh, so uh, I'm sure that, uh, yeah, we are happy to continue, so we'll continue at the next update. <laughs> So um, please stay uh, in your seats as we are now ready to hear the closing address. And uh, before that one, please join me in thanking all these wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, so now for the closing address, uh, I would like to hand over to Professor Ed Aspinall and also Dr. Um, Amalinda Safitri, uh, who will introduce our speaker.
Amalinda Safirani. Safirani. Oh, Safirani. Apologies. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you everyone for staying for our final session and it gives me great pleasure today to welcome a special guest uh, to give our closing address. It's long been a tradition in the Indonesia update that we invite as well as academics, journalists and other forms of commentators, people who are directly involved in, uh, as practitioners uh, in the topic that we are discussing for the Indonesia update. So it makes a lot of sense that with our topic being governing urban Indonesia, that we end with someone who's actually been doing just that, i.e. governing a very big and important part of urban Indonesia. So our guest today is Bima Arya Sugi Sugiharto, who has been mayor of Bogor, as I'm sure everyone here knows. Uh, not Tangsel, ever. Uh, not Tangsel, yeah. Um, so there's been a bit of a competition this com between Surabaya, Tangsel, Bogor, Bandung. Um, but Pap Bima has been the mayor of Bogor since 2014, so coming to the close of his term very soon. Before that, he had a, a, a very successful career in academia, uh, running a, a polling institute, amongst other things. Uh, and uh, as it happens, he also has a PhD uh, from this university. In fact, I can see his former supervisor sitting right there in the middle, Pat Greg Feely. So, so for Pat Bima, this is a sort of back to campus moment uh, and a back to Canberra moment. And I should also welcome back to Canberra, uh, Ibu, Ane, uh, Ibu Yane Ardian Rahman as well. You're also very welcome. It's great to see you back here. But there's one more element of uh, Pat Bima's CV which makes him very appropriate as our closing speaker, uh, namely that as well as being the mayor of Bogor, he's also the chair of APEXI, so the Asociasi Pemerinta Kota Seluruh Indonesia, so the All uh, Indonesia Association of City Governments, the organization of city mayors. So arguably you could say he is the best placed person to give us a practitioner's view, a view from the inside of governing urban Indonesia. So thank you very much. Papima. Thank you very much, Paet, Ibu Linda. Uh, thanks for inviting me to the update. And I really enjoy the perspective on urban issues which were circulated yesterday and today. And allow me to enrich those perspectives by adding insight from my experience or if I may say, an honest review from the field. And uh, frankly to say, it is not easy for me to summarize my 10 years experience as a mayor, especially uh, in responding to what Mustafa said yesterday, that what is happening in Bogor is only midway reform. <laughs> Been there, done that, ups and down, and he said, only midway reform. <laughs> So uh, I think I will be your first and strongest supporter if you are nominating yourself as the mayor of Tangsel. <laughs> <laughs> to lead all the Tangselians. <laughs> so I will explore the dynamics of city leadership, the challenges it faces, and also the leadership model chosen in addressing those challenges. And as Ed said, um, this, pers this perspective can also be seen as the, the, the experience shared by uh, mayors across of Indonesia because I have uh, a lot of opportunities, not only observing, but also uh, in channeling the mayor aspirations at the national level. Um, let me begin with the issue of 
election campaign. I would like to highlight the importance of election campaign. It does not only determine who will win the election, but also how the elected mayor can effectively run the government. More specifically, the campaign fund factor, dana kampanye. Yes, politics is expensive. And yes, everything needs money. But I am convinced that how we deal the money and how we found our campaign determine our performance. Yes, it is hard to win the election. Yes, it is very difficult to win the election with a very low cost of budget. But learning and observing from any local election in Indonesia, I believe that leading the city will be harder and much more complicated when we are trapped by the interests of donors and sponsors who funded our campaign. So the first and early fight is actually a fight to remain independent at any cost. I remember rejecting a donations and, uh, and a contribution for a number of business persons, including a one big tobacco industry who uh, uh, want to uh, help uh, our campaign at that time. Because Bogor is known as one of the frontliner city who has a very strong firm in dealing with tobacco control, Kota Anti Roko. Thank you. And until the end of uh, campaign session, back in 2014, no more than 10 billion rupees was, was spent. And this amount was among the lowest compared to other candidates at the time. My primary source of funding coming from families, friends, seniors, and other donors who contributed without any first step interest, in my opinion. And I narrowly won by margin only 1,755, or 0.25%, slightly margin after going through a very tough election filled with a negative campaign. And I thought that was the hardest one. I thought that was the toughest one, but I was wrong. Like all elected mayors in Indonesia, the post-election politics challenged me more. Once elected, it was clear to me that while change is easily spoken, it is indeed difficult to put it into action. Leading a city, for me, not just about having ideas or even courage. And I realized at the time, the golden moment being a political analyst and political commentator has gone. <laughs> no more media darling. Everything that I do, everything that I say could possibly be wrong. And uh, when I was inaugurated, I, would I was like a king with any power to execute my vision. But in fact, I found that mayor is not the only actor. Mayor is not the only king. There are many more powerful actors, like senior bureaucrats, senior party leaders, a big entrepreneurs who has their own interests. And also mass media and even contractors who are exercising their strong influence among the bureaucracy. And these actors are actually bound by one common interest in securing their interests under a very collusive system. And I found that it is not easy to make our local budget truly benefit our people. I discovered that a handful of players tend to monopolize the projects. These key players 
are often end up as the winners in the procurement system funded by city budget. And something that I could never imagine before is the illegal intervention of certain law enforcers in the city projects. You see, sometimes these officials ask for a share of government project funds. And if the request isn't granted, they begin to criminalizing bureaucracy by involving local NGOs and also the media. And some local NGO or LSM are actually part of the problems. Not NGOs like ACO Foundation, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> they play a political maneuver as pressure group in collaborating with law enforcers and mass media for economic purpose. And looking inside the city hall in Balai Kota, it was even more challenging to see the character of the bureaucrats, dominated by senior bureaucrat whose careers were built upon the old trajectory created by my predecessors. I was the first non-bureaucrats to be elected as a mayor, and I am the first Bogorian to be elected as a mayor. And I'm also the, the youngest mayor ever in Bogor history. Can you imagine the, 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 the complication of my status at that time? And I also face a top-down development planning system with almost no public participation. It was very sad to know that the actual uh, government department's activities don't seem to align with the mayor visions. So mayors may come and go, but the, the department's plans often still the same. It's like copy-pasting from the previous uh, plan, year to year. And our city budget can be quite inefficient. A significant am amount of money can be allocated to things they may not bring substantial impact or output. For example, planting 50 trees can cost 10 million rupees for expenses like producing t-shirts, setting up tents, providing meals, snacks, and so on and so forth. So biaya makan minum is so expensive. And Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, in the middle of these situations, it is important to note that the middle class, the middle class in Bogor is growing in numbers, with many of them commuting to work in Jakarta on a daily basis, but they tend to be very skeptical with the local issues and unconsolidated. They basically don't care about what is happening in the city of Bogor. On the other hand, another NGOs, like I mentioned before, are very active in collaborating with dirty players. Bapak, Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, I have to admit that in the middle of 2014, the first few months after I elected, I felt like a lonely guy in town who has impossible mission. <laughs> of course, uh, giving up is not the option. In facing of these challenging situations, it is clear that we need a very effective strategy. And I do believe that the most significant step is to break the vicious circle, lingkaran setan, and the chain of corrupt practices. And it is crucial to declare and to prove that the mayor will never enrich themselves and never accept any gift from anyone, from any parties that could compromise our integrity and decision-making independence. And I have known some of my colleagues, inspiring mayors, who show a high level of integrity. Some of them like Ibu Risma, Pak Azwar Anas, and Pak Ridwan Kamil in Bandung, for example. And I urge 
all the government officials to stay focused on their works and not trouble themselves in pleasing and serving the mayor. So breaking the vicious circle, I believe it should be started by the example from the top position. And in facing all of these challenges, I only have two options, deliver or fail. And reforming our bureaucracy is a top priority. I made the process of creating our city development plan, our APBD, more open by involving think tank, universities, creative communities, and so on and so forth. And I made the city budget document accessible to the public. We announced a number of uh, uh, channels for the public to voice their concerns and aspirations. And in 2019, we opened the uh, public service mall. I learned from Banyuwangi, from Pak Azwaranas, which has now become one of the best in Indonesia. It is one of the model for uh, Indonesian other cities. And we want to provide the best service to our citizens. Not only to make the service easier, but also to make people happier. For example, the citizen can do the uh, marriage contract at our public service mall, Akatnika, and if they are lucky, the mayor will be the witness. <laughs> Make them happier. And as the high standard of the achievement for all bureaucrats in the city of Bogor, and I increased their allowance, which are now among one of the highest in Indonesia. And talking about public spaces, as far as the public interest is concerned, I realize that I have to prove that the government is strongly committed to making the city belong to public. I believe that sense of belonging to the city is really important for bounding the citizen with their leaders and their city. So we improve the quality of public spaces such as city, park, city parks, pedestrian paths, government buildings, and also slum areas. The areas which, which were initially occupied by local thug, preman-preman local, Oknum RT, RW, were revitalized and normalized, so the people can use it freely, and uh, it's, it's, it's normal now. And, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and in the very, and after uh, 15 years, after 50 years and hundreds of meetings with the many parties, the Yasmin Church case was resolved. For some parties, I see that it is not the ideal solution because the church has to move around one kilometer from the original site. But I believe it is the best possible option. The case should be closed and we have to move on. So for me, it was not fulfilling my campaign promises, but it was like returning the image of Bogor as the city for all. And uh, in very uncertain political situations, linked with strong pragmatism and transactional culture, the alternative options is building a support from the community. And since 2010, I have witnessed how a new breed of local leaders started bringing together the strength of community, academia, think tank, uh, entrepreneurs, creative communities, youngster, Gen Z, uh, Gen X, millennial, and so on and so forth. And in our city, in the city of Bogor, one good example is Bogor Sahabat, the Friends of Bogor, which has become one of my circle esteem in guiding government policies. These communities cares about issues like nationalism, diversity, and the environment. They provide a very strong support for any city government policy related to these issues. And Bapak Ibu, besides consolidating communities and the middle class, staying close to the grassroots level is also important. I have implemented a mayor's 10 program, Tenda Wali Kota, where I stay overnight among the uh, residents in listening to their voice and their critics, and setting up my office in neighborhood 
or ngantor di kelurahan to check on the performance of our staff. And uh, over 10 years, almost every weekend, I've been doing something that I never imagined before as part of mayor's duty. That is the witness or the wedding of the citizen. Every weekend during uh, my administration, almost 10 years. And uh, apart from the support from the grassroots and the middle class, it is very vital to establish connections with national political leaders. In many cases, mayor face obstacles in implementing the programs or encounter legal issues when they don't have good relations with party elites or political elites in Jakarta. So building relations with governors, with ministers, with party leaders, and even with the president is important. Bapak, Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, I realize that in many situations, being realistic is crucial. Sometimes our ideal plans cannot be achieved or may not be worked out. So in those cases, we should be willing to compromise and negotiate to come up with plan B, plan C, and plan D when our first choice or ideal scenario is not feasible. So this applies not just for cases like Yasmin Church cases, but also another uh, sensitive issues like uh, dealing with PKL, reforming the bureaucracy, and also working with the council members. Um, in many cases, I was criticized for failing public expectations, but my argument is always like that. This decision should be made, case closed, and we have to move on. The best among the worst and the most possible option should be chosen among any available options. Um, Bapak Ibu, the direct election system has actually paved the way for the emergence of local champions. Local autonomy creates local champions. I am inspired and learn from many inspiring local leaders like Ibu Risma, Pak Jokowi, and Kang Ridwan Kamil. There is a book called If Mayors Rule the World by Benjamin Barber. It is like the Bible for mayors. And I was given one copy by senior economist Bang Faisal Basri before I took office as a mayor in 2014. So according to Barber, city leadership holds power and authority beyond the boundaries of the city or even beyond the boundaries of nation state. But this kind of influence is weakening in Indonesia today. There is a worrying trend where the central government is gaining more authority. Recentralization is actually taking place in Indonesia today. The trend is evident in omnibus law, for example. And as the chairperson of APEC C, I have frequently voiced my concern publicly. Our message is clear. We must not sacrifice our democracy, our local autonomy, and our unique local wisdom for the sake of economic growth and investment. And at our last national meeting of APEX in, Mac in Makassar, we invite these three presidential candidates to discuss not only understanding their views on urban issues and also their commitment to the democracy, but also their plan about local autonomy. I am glad that there will be no question and answer session. So I <laughs> So I didn't have to respond about these three candidates. <laughs> so Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, I believe local autonomy and democracy are two essential aspects if you want to achieve Indonesia Mas 2045. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pak Arya Bima, Pak Wali. Bima Arya, I'm sorry, Pak. <laughs> Pak Bima Arya. It looks like I, the first time I met him, so mix of the name. So we have 10 minutes of Q&A, uh, but this is off program. 
of program. I hope you are staying with us still. So maybe two questions from the audience only, not the online one. Sorry, teman-teman di online. Uh, maybe Bu Jeki, ladies first, Pak Zulhan, maaf. <laughs> Bu Jeki satu, anyone from here, from this side? Oke, okay. uh, cowok mungkin ya, and the back one. The lady on the back, oke. Okay. So, no, one female and one male. So we have a... Ibu Jeki, saya persilakan very... Thank you very much, Pak Bima, for a fantastic presentation. I have to take you up on your invitation to ask about what happened at the... Uh, when you talked to the presidential candidates about the future of lo local autonomy. Um, and what is driving recentralization from your perspective um, as a mayor? Thank you. Okay, the second gentleman. Yeah, my name is uh, Shafi Antonia from Tasca Indonesia. Uh, my question is very direct regarding the how to fund and to enlarge the public space and then how to invite the localities in funding the public space and particularly maintaining. For instance, we have a co-park in Jakarta initiated by Pak Anis, very good, excellent, but today quite disastrous. Okay. Number two. Just one, Pak, I'm okay, so sorry. Thank you. thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, <laughs> Pak Arya Bima, please. One more question. One more question? Okay, one question more, extra. Oh, Mbak Lila, silakan, Mbak. My name is Lila, and I would like to ask about uh, uh, some cases where it involves uh, some local government leaders. For instance, like the, the Bantaing Bupati, Professor Nurdin, who then after he got elected as the governor in South Sulawesi, and then it's not just, um, it's just like a, a few years after he was elected, then he caught in corruption, and it was like a... To me, he was like the, the one of the reform leaders, very, very popular, but then he was still captured in the ransacking and corruption um, tradition or situation like that. What do you think about that, Pak? Okay, thank you so much. About the dilemma in uh, managing public spaces. Yes, I have to admit that uh, the maintenance is very crucial. It is kind of habit from the, the bureaucracy. We allocated the high amount of money in building, in the renovating, but not for maintenance. But actually, the recipe is, 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 is clear. We have to collaborate with the third party. So many uh, uh, projects of public parks public gar uh, garden, for example, or even sport venue, uh, we are collaborating with the third party. As long as the rule is clear, as long as it's not against the law. So we have to ensure that it is long-term maintenance because it is a problem within the bureaucracy in terms of the uh, expertise and also the uh, the the amount of no, the amount of money that uh, we have in allocating for the maintenance and uh, another important issue as it already mentioned by uh, from singapore the previous speaker rita uh, burita you are right yeah the dilemma is making the public spaces accessible for anyone regarding their background so it is, it is quite complicated. For example, now we are renovating our alun-alun. But the problem is uh, most of the visitors are coming not from the city of Bogor, from Tangerang Selatan, from Depok, <laughs> from Bekasi. If I ask, why, why are you here? Because I don't have such this place at our city. So, uh, and the background is, is very uh, different. Uh, starting from the you know the ibu-ibu pengajian, ibu-ibu sosialita, and so on and so forth, and I have to provide something that make them comfort, and it's not easy because they are coming from different background. So uh, making the public spaces comfort 
for everyone and can be accessible from anyone for anyone is, is not easy. That's the, the, the dilemma of the public spaces. And uh, what is another question? Uh, okay. If we are referring to some of local champions like uh, Ibu Risma, Pak Ridwan Kamil, Azwar Anas, because they're maximizing the discrecy, they're maximizing the authority to do the creativity. So if we are losing that right, so that gonna be a very big problem for local leaders. And it is also about democracy. For example, I have a deep concerns on appointing pejabat wali kota, pejabat bupati, pejabat gubernur. It is not direct elections. They don't have mandate. They don't know exactly what is going on at the grassroots level. So my concern is if pejabat-pejabat ini sukses or consider uh, more performance rather than uh, uh, elected official elected one, so the push to return the election to DPRD will be stronger. So uh, it is one of my concern. So we don't want to lose the direct election because it's good for the right of citizen and for the dynamic of city leadership. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, the case of Pak Nudin Abdullah is also referring to what he did during the campaign election. It's about Dana Kampanye. I think he was trapped with the old trajectory of finding the, uh, the fund for campaign and collaborating with some uh, local vendors, some sort of things. So that's why I emphasize the importance of uh, you know, the, our independence in, uh, in uh, looking for uh, Dana Kampanye. Thank you. So, we finally come to the end. Uh, Ed and I would like to thank Indonesia Project, uh, also congratulate for the 40 years of these uh, activities. Uh, Pak Budi, Pak Blin, and others, uh, and of, of course you all as a participants that have been staying with us over the past two days, and the competition between Tangsel, Bogor, Jakarta, and Bandung, and others, a very lively discussion that we have had over the past two years. I'm so happy, Ed and I are very happy with this uh, discussion. And then, of course, we are thankful for the presenter that has uh, written papers, uh, um, preparing presentations uh, on and off, and of course, um, uh, especially Pak Abidin Kusno who traveled from far away, Yogi and others, uh, very happy and very thankful for you all to be here. And of course, the discussion were very strict on making sure that we are on time, the discussion, everyone that has been, you know, actively involved in this uh, 14 uh, Indonesia update um, successful. So for the detail, thank you. Ed will, you know, going into detail with on the names. So please, Ed. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for everyone who's helped to make uh, this such a great success. Um, I'd also particularly like to thank uh, the sponsor, DFAT, uh, which has been sponsoring these Indonesia Update events for a long time. The Asia Foundation also, if you notice, made a special contribution uh, for this event. Uh, and I'd like to thank our speakers, Pat Bima in particular, it's wonderful to have you here, but all of our speakers. Um, and I would just note for our speakers, our paper writers, as, you, uh, as we now think of you, um, you're, you're the chapter writers, actually, as we now think of you, after we close today, if you wouldn't mind just gathering at the front and we have some special messages for you about <laughs> deadlines and things like that. Um, so, 
uh, in addition, behind the scenes, uh, and sometimes sort of in the front here as well, uh, we've had a lot of people who've been working uh, very hard to make this uh, event so successful. In particular, there's been a group of student volunteers, uh, our postgraduates. So let, 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 me, let me quickly name them. Uh, Alfin Febrian Basundoro, Krishna Satrio, Saraswati Eko Sumando, Haura, who's been managing a very difficult job, managing all the online uh, questions, and Gary Rosario da Gama as well. So thank you to all our volunteers. Then there's been an amazing team uh, from the ANU and in particular from the Indonesia project uh, who have made uh, for Linda and I what seems to be a very difficult, complicated task for us as conference conveners has actually made it very difficult, uh, very easy I should say, uh, because uh, they've been doing so much of the work uh, behind the scenes. So we have uh, Lolita Morena who um, coordinated the volunteers. Uh, Lydia Napitupulu, who's managing our, who's our, uh, the Indonesia Projects person in Jakarta, who is of course um, uh, running the Zoom and online audience from Indonesia. Uh, Nasita Angreni, uh, who has done incredible, provided incredible support for our speakers. Alex Scott's down here, uh, the communications and social media manager extraordinaire. And finally, and finally, the person who sort of orchestrated the whole event, who's definitely earned a very strong cup of tea this afternoon, uh, Catherine Whitney. <laughs> so thank you very much. And now to close events, I'll hand over to Papudi. I will be quick. Uh, quick. Uh, uh, first, let us join uh, to, uh, me to thank uh, Paet and Ibu Amalinda for their hard work. Um, thank you, Ed and uh, Bu Amalinda, um, for your work. Uh, but I'm still waiting for the book. <laughs> uh, uh, next is I would like to invite uh, Sana Jeffrey who will uh, be uh, co convene the next year update with Eve uh, to tell us a bit about what their plan uh, for next year. Thank you, Babudi. So next year's Indonesia update will look at 10 years of the Jokowi presidency. I will be convening it with my colleague and my friend from the Department of Political and Social Change at the ANU, Dr. Eve Warburton. Um, uh, we will begin uh, with a roundup of the 2024 elections um, and the economic update. Uh, but the thematic portion of the update will look back at the ways in which President Jokowi has changed Indonesia. We know that President Jokowi has emerged as one of the most polarizing political figures in the post-reformacy period. His supporters have praised his remarkable evolution from a political outsider to a formidable power broker who has pushed bold economic reform and an ambitious infrastructure agenda. But he has also been criticized, as we saw yesterday, for his government's heavy-handed measures against political opponents and efforts to realize his grand economic vision at the cost of democratic freedoms. Regardless of which side of the debate one is on, um, there is no denying that, the Jokowi, the, that Jokowi has had an enduring um, popularity with the public, that his presidency has fundamentally transformed Indonesia by pushing its institutions to the limit, and that in doing so, he has revealed both strengths and weaknesses of Indonesia's democracy. At the 2024 update, we will convene experts from Indonesia and around the world to examine this transformation by looking at um, a few aspects of his presidency. We will be looking at the physical mark that Jokowi, uh, Jokowi's decade has left on the country's land, forests and infrastructure. We will look at the economic change that moved Indonesia into the upper middle income category um, and rewrote the terms of investments across a range of sectors. We will look at the political shakeup during his presidency and the impact on the courts, security apparatus, and key institutions of political accountability. 
Finally, we'll look at the international di uh, dimension of his governance strategy and how it has affected Indonesia's global standing compared to 10 years ago. So these are the kinds of issues we'll be discussing. I hope you are able to join us next year around the same time. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a, one more uh, uh, announcement. For those who already booked a lunch book, the lunch book will be uh, provided in uh, our tea rooms. And finally, I would like to thank all the speaker, Pak Bima and the others for their willingness to come. And also, I would like to thank all of you who come to this uh, update and uh, very supportive to our activities. Uh, with that, I uh, would like to close this update and uh, hope to see you again uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you.